Okay, welcome everybody to the Pickens County Board of County Commissioners work session on Tuesday, July 28th. I'm Kelly McNicholas Curry, Vice Chair. Also in the room with me is Commissioner Patty Clapper and Jordan Batchelor, who's helping us uh, run the Zoom meeting. And commissioners joining us from home are George Newman and Greg Poshman, and our chair, Steve Child, who I will turn the meeting over to now. Hi, welcome everybody. Um, today, our first thing on our agenda, we're gonna have a presentation on the Phillips Mobile Home Park. And part of that is there are three different options that we will be looking at, I think is a big part of the meeting. So I'm looking forward to it. Uh, we've got lots of different guests with us. I will turn it over to Phyllis Matthijs to to start off the discussion on this. Phyllis? Hi, everyone. Phyllis Matthijs, Deputy County Manager. Uh, pleased to have with me today, Laura Kirk, uh, from DHM, who's our lead consultant in this project. I think we're almost at two years maybe working on this. Uh, Bob Schultz from Bob Schultz Consulting, uh, who is our outreach person. Uh, Chris Lopez, uh, part of Project Moxie, who's working um, on helping us on financing some of the infrastructure that we need. Jay Hammond from SDM engineering um so thank you um we have our debris flow uh information to be presented today which is some new information and then also invited were gail schwartz and john fox rubin who are with habitat um who are interested in what we're doing here so with that i'm going to turn it over to i'm not sure if laura or bob are taking the lead here um with the presentation you all had in your packet um the options that we're looking at um, as well as uh, the PowerPoint. Okay. Um, we're going to get set up here. So again, I'm Laura Kirk with DHM Design, and we're happy to be here with you all this afternoon on the Zoom meeting. Um, you know, we've all been in a lot of Zoom meetings, but um, just if you have questions as we go along, uh, please feel free to um, ask those. And um, we're happy to and looking forward to entering into dialogue with you about the Phillips project. So um, the PowerPoint has just a few updates from what was in your packet, but uh, basically um, mirrors what you what you've. Uh, had in your packet and so had an opportunity to review. Um, today we wanted to um, begin by sharing some new information, review new alternatives which look at all of the units above Lower River Road and then uh, through conversation with you all, um, hopefully get direction on which alternative to move forward with to the pre-application process. Next, Bob. So um, the new information includes um, input from the debris flow study that was conducted by uh, SGM and Tetra Tech. And um, Jay Hammond is on the call as well. So I'm going to give uh, the layperson's overview of the debris flow study. And if you have specific information uh, or questions uh, that you're looking for, Jay would be uh, the person to fill, that, fill in on that. So. Um, in looking at the site, there are three primary debris flow basins, which we're calling the North, Middle, and South Basin. And the North Basin is the most impactful. Um, this is something that we had kind of known all along, and um, uh, we're looking for information on how that would impact the site. So um, through Tetra Tech's work, um, what they have done is to try to create the, the most sort of natural channel for the debris flow. And that uh, requires relocation of two existing units and um, uh, discontinuing the continuous road through the existing hillside there. And so we end up with two uh, hammerheads there. 
Now this has been um, looked at by the fire department and they have signed off on that uh, at a conceptual level. So um, before we move on, are there any questions here about the debris flow study? I have a, I have a question. Sure. Um, so the middle basin debris flow area is directly above where the new tripex and quadru quadplex plans are locating those units. Is that correct? Yeah, and we can go to that uh, okay. next slide. All right. Bob, can you go to that next slide? So um, that's a, a much smaller basin. Um, I, I did want to ask about the north basin. Are we going to come back to that? Sure, let's go back to that. And Greg, why don't you Sorry. go to that first, and then we can come to the middle basin. Um, yeah, just just thinking. Uh, we're, so we're going to turn it from a, a like a, a through street into two uh, streets with turnarounds. Have we? Um, I guess you've done the, the the deep thinking on what that's doing to traffic in there. Uh, that the fire department signed off is reassuring, but it did make me wonder. Just um, is that the is that the best way to do this? And it, it sounds like a, a path, a, fo a footpath, will replace what are we trying to do, avoid an expensive bridge in there or is a bridge just not an option at the base for de debris flow? I, I, I'd just love to have someone describe the thought process. Jay, do you want to um, go into the, a little bit of that? Uh, certainly, Greg. In fact, uh, you sort of touched on some of the considerations that went into the decision to show it as uh, cutting off the roadway through there you know to the extent that that is a loop road and people use it as such there will be you know some inconvenience i guess of using both ends as an in and out so there is a an inconvenience there uh we were concerned about emergency yeah. access of course and uh yes the the alternative we were looking at was to probably construct a pretty significant bridge structure in order to have sufficient opening that a debris flow could move under the bridge. And, you know, the debris flow is a pretty high volume out of that basin. Uh, it has large, you know, potentially large rock and debris. Uh, and so to truly span the potential debris flow uh, would, would truly be a pretty significant bridge structure, which we saw as a pretty expensive alternative. So I would say that's not out of the question. Uh, we didn't show it as such because of the potential expense. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate that. And that's, that sounds reasonable to me. And I'm also thinking maybe the residents would like not having flow through traffic through there. It just might slow things down a bit. Well, we'll be hearing what the reaction is, I'm thinking. I think Kelly has her hand up. Kelly, and then all the way in after Kelly. Can you explain to me how that um, higher unit is spared from the debris flow? I'm calling it higher. I think it's further up the hillside, and it's showing up uh, furthest to the right on this depiction. I can speak to that, Laura, then. Um, yet, well, yes, and, and as you characterize it, it's, it's very hard to tell from this sort of photo view of what's going on there, but the channel uh, kind of runs through the area below that unit, and the unit is quite a bit higher than the channel. So when Tetratech was running their analysis, they said, we don't think that unit is a concern. Uh, and then the two units we need to remove are because of an effort to sort of straighten the channel and keep the debris flowing in that area. So yes, that the unit to the right is high and it's well above the channel and we don't think it needs to be removed. Thank you. And my question has to do with um, whether we should look at a bridge across the debris flow channel or not. And I think part of it would be the, you know, what do the residents there want? Have they been polled on this question at this point? Um, then also, there 
you know, just in terms of delivery trucks and things, I used to drive a school bus through there on that road at one time when the Roaring Fork School District still ran a school bus clear up there. Uh, and it was the only way to get through practically was to go clear through on the road. Now the school bus is not an issue anymore, but bigger delivery trucks or um, home moving things or things might be a concern. How are they gonna turn around? That sort of thing. So have the residents been polled? That'd be the first question. The residents have not been polled on whether they'd be willing to pay for a bridge over there. Uh, we got to a certain point and, and uh, just said, you know, on a per unit basis, this is going to be an extraordinary cost and we're already going to be replacing all the utilities, building a new sewer plant and trying to buy the land. And so the concern just becomes affordability. Um, the impacted homeowners that are here in Orange, uh, we have spoken with uh, those homeowners to uh, brief them on the findings and, and try and answer any questions that they have about the, uh, the findings in the study. So that's been the extent of it. Uh, Steve, just uh, for me at least, when we start looking at these costs per unit uh, with water, wastewater, uh, basically all of the utilities, it just starts to, to get, get tough to put in a, a really expensive bridge on top of that. Steve, can I and ask okay, if I can, thinking if I well, could let me add, mention, uh, tag on one thing first. Um, we could, I mean, we could always at some point in the future, a bridge could be added at some later date far in the future at any time. If we, if we did this, the hammerhead thing, um, if for some reason it just didn't work out, we could do the bigger expense later on in the future. Steve, can I tag on to your so, question uh, real quick? Yeah, go ahead, well, Patty. The question, the, the question to the homeowners in polling them should not be, do you want to pay for an expensive bridge? It should be, how do you feel about having, you know, these dead ends at the end of your street and having two cars or having and trucks and vehicles having to pass each other on, you know, those driveways that drive, you know, those roads They'll have to have some way because some it's pretty narrow in there at some places. So I think the question would be um, not so much. Of course, they're going to say no. We don't want to pay for an expensive bridge. But how do you feel about you know having dead ends at the end of your street and the and two way traffic coming up and going rather than you know a lot of people go all the way through and then you don't have to pass cars while you're doing so. But I think I think we should ask them what their preference and how they feel about it. I think that's what we've been doing all all along. Um, and just see, because I have concerns about, um, you know, two-way traffic on those roads, not having the opportunity or the option of going straight through. Okay, Kelly. Thanks. Um, with with this as proposed, with um, the the dead end streets and then the walking um, path. Is there an opportunity for any other type of programming in that area? Um, you know, if someone wanted to store something there, could they? Or if a, could you put a swing set over there? Um, I just am having a hard time envisioning what that area is actually going to look like and if there's a utility to it beyond um, the debris flow basin. I think there are things that we could do, you know, at the end of the hammerhead so it doesn't feel, you know, so that it fits somehow in the landscape. Um, the channel itself, um, I, you know, I think we've talked preliminarily about um, doing that in a way that feels as naturalized as possible so that it, um, but uh, it, it will need to meet some uh, technical requirements. So we have not okay. explored yet that idea of, you know, creating playgrounds or some kind of, um, you know, exactly what that site or landscape would look like. Um, Community garden. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm just thinking about some cohesion in the neighborhood mm -hmm. as opposed to, mm -hmm. you know, 
yep. um, what we have now, <laughs> just like a pod here, a yep. pod there, a pod here, and a pod there. So. Okay, I don't see any more questions now. Laura, go ahead. Okay, I just wanted to add one last thing about this, that in a, in a major debris flow event, the debris flow would uh, flow over Lower River Road. Um, and I think Tetratech and SGM are um, suggesting that there be a culvert improvement under Lower River Road to take care of what they call more uh, kind of minor um, events so that when you have sort of smaller stream events that goes under Lower River Road. So that will be a part of uh, the project development as we move along. Next slide, Bob. So yeah, Patty had that question on the middle basin. So I guess we'll get to that now. Yep. So the middle basin um, is uh, above some of the areas that we're looking at for new housing. It's much, um, uh, much less uh, impactful. And there is a natural area there where that um, debris flow has collected historically. There were some modifications made to the site over time that brought the debris uh, further down into the site. And so in talking with Tetra Tech and SGM, um, we think that you know a good scenario is to look at um, sort of, if you will, restoring that um, more natural place for the debris to fall into and that uh, protects the units below it. Jay, I don't know if you wanna add anything before questions. Uh, I think you covered it generally, Laura, and I, I think the key here is the simple fact that it's a it's a much smaller basin, it's a much lower volume, and it's an opportunity to sort of create a trap feature that would simply trap a larger event and keep it from moving further downhill. There would be a maintenance component where if you did get a flow that sort of filled up the basin that you would need to go up and, and scoop it out and remove it in order to get capacity back. Uh, but again, it's a low likelihood event and we can protect those units uh, in that area with a fairly simple structure. Steve, Steve, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Patty. Yeah, well, if we didn't put the units there, as I, mean, I thought we already agreed to put the units above the other units, but if we didn't put the units there, would we need to do anything to that that debris flow there? We, could we just leave it as is? I think the answer to that, Patty, is we could leave it as is. In other words, the, the area that's kind of threatened by that basin is really sort of that the meadow area. So uh, it continues to the south and east as you go down through there. And to the extent that, you know, it, it would not potentially affect units, you could leave it alone. Okay, so that would save us some money, right? <laughs> The uh, could affect the placement of if we do have a solar array there. Solar array is further down, I believe, isn't it? Further up valley? Maybe a little bit further up valley. Thank you. Okay. And then uh, there is a the south basin, which is um, even further up valley, but that um, poses little threat to uh, the Phillips property and is not in a location where any development is being proposed. So there was no intervention proposed for that. So um, that's a, a summary of where we're at with the debris flow analysis. Okay, let's move on. Um, so uh, we met with you I'm gonna say, I think it was pre-COVID, um, which feels like a long time ago. But, um, and this was the plan that we had discussed with you and that um, you had approved. Oops, Bob, here we go. Um, where it showed housing on both sides of Lower River Road, uh, 
there were um, lots that were closer to the river for, um, you know, which were seen as being uh, more comparable for people on the Riverview side if they were relocating to this side of the property. Um, and then we had uh, proposed lots uh, for mobile home units there adjacent to the ranch house, as well as some um, replacement relocation spaces on the upper side of Lower River Road, again, for mobile home units. And then um, a layout of six triplexes above the existing hillside units. Bob, can you go to the next slide? So this is just uh, a blow up of uh, the site plan as we had discussed it in March. I've got a question. Sure, go ahead. And, and maybe, Phyllis, maybe you can answer this, but um, with those existing units, isn't one of those um, one of those spaces being utilized now as an office? And couldn't we uh, re, uh, reuse that as an actual resident space? I don't see why we would need an office there, in one of those key, key lots. You're correct, George, one of them is an office. Um, I'd have to go back to our purchase agreement because that's the one that the Phillips family uses. Right, but they're also using the, um, the, the ranch house too, correct? Correct, and Harriet's in a unit also. Yeah. Okay, it just seems like there's, you have to sort of see what the, what the arrangement is, but I, I'd like to have that clarified. So um, what we have, uh, what we are bringing to you today is we've um, looked at a couple of other alternatives where um, all of the proposed units and lots are above Lower River Road. And um, we've maintained that area around the ranch house as open space without any further development in that location. The three alternatives uh, we've named, the approved plan, the one that you uh, previously looked at, this one we'll call the triplex plan, and, uh, and it has some nuances that are different than the previous one. And then the third we'll call the quad plan, so just in terms of referring to them and, uh, and providing direction, those are the, the language that we'll be using. They're all good plans that have uh, different uh, attractive features and different consequences. So they're just providing you with some trade-offs for the commission to tell us where you land with regard to those. The original one uh, was kind of driven by a couple of things. Uh, one, having those relocation sites that were closer to the river that seemed more like uh, river view and uh, clear direction from the uh, BOCC to avoid the large ag field uh, as much as possible. And then after uh, some additional discussion and, and we started having some initial conversations with Habitat for Humanity, uh, you asked us to look at some uh, alternatives to bring back to you that, that uh, played off of some of those ideas. So this is one of them. Uh, we're moving all of the relocation spaces and the new development above Lower River Road so that allows the area between Lower River Road and the uh, river to be primarily uh, uh, unoccupied. And, um, <clears throat> when we do that, we have to create space for those 10 relocation lots, and that moves our access road uh, driveway from Lower River Road into the site further up valley. And when we do that to catch grade, we, we end up having greater impact on the, uh, that large agricultural field. But the kind of the trade-off to that is that we can move the triplex units, the new development, uh, a little bit further up valley. And that takes us out of some of the steeper portions of the slope, and it allows us to have shorter utility runs. So there, there are some uh, 
you know, once again, trade-offs that uh, each one of these has some advantages and some consequences that we'd like you to consider. Also a reminder that the uh, farther we go up valley, we're into the sunnier portion of the site. There's a dashed yellow line that I'm hoping you can see on your screen. Uh, and that area, which is above the existing hillside units, is the area that in the approved plan uh, would be occupied by triplex units uh, and now is available for, for open space. The trade-off is we're down into that ag field uh, on, on this. If you look at the bottom line of the table on this chart, it talks about the agricultural acres available. So in the previous version, it was 5.8 acres. And in this version, it's five. So that's uh, sort of the, the trade-off. There's the same number of units in this one as in the uh, previous plan. Uh, one of the things about the uh, triplex style units uh, that we'll show you in just a minute is that you get all of your uh, circulation, the stairs in essence, are internal to the building, which in in the winter time is nice that uh, you know you're you're using a townhome style product where you can uh, walk up inside the building. These could be modular, they could be stick built. There's there's really no uh, limitation in that and. A note on all of these out of the 65 acres, every one of them is going to have more than 50 acres that is available for open space. So the the amount of the site that's actually used for uh, any development is uh, is a modest part percentage <coughs> of the entire site. On the bottom of this table, you see a number of linear feet of proposed roads. This is about 1,200 uh, linear feet less than the approved uh, version. And, you know, so in terms of building roads and extending utilities, that's sort of a marker that we're using about efficiency uh, with regard to uh, future costs of infrastructure. This is a drawing that you have uh, seen before, but it tries to give you a sense of how we're using the triplex in the slope to help catch some of that grade and do it in an efficient way. And once again, showing the uh, circulation interior to the, the building. The quad plan is, um, is another iteration off of this theme and some some things that happened when we started looking at this we using the same uh, driveway infrastructure so the same impact onto the large ag field the quad scenario would give you the opportunity to have more units and to use less land so uh, we are uh, allowing more of the land to be available for uh, open space and we're also uh, using uh, lower slope area that has certain advantage from a constructability uh, perspective. When you look at this uh, a little bit closer, the little boxes that are in front of the relocation spaces, those are concepts for storage. Once we have a final uh, site design or uh, direction from you, we can put a pencil to those and they may move around or there may be less of them. For now, we're just showing them as a placeholder to let you know that uh, there's the possibility to have a, uh, an option for uh, some storage on site. Going back to the linear feet of proposed roads, uh, this one has even less uh, uh, linear feet of proposed roads. Uh, as you see that in the previous slide, that yellow area got bigger and it has the same amount of uh, ag acres because the uh, road system is the same as in the previous plan. One of the metrics that we'll be talking about in a minute when we look at all of these together is FTEs. And, and all that is is looking at our bedroom of new units 
and uh, taking the uh, the FTE equivalent that APTRA uses to say, if we were a private developer, how many uh, employees would we be housing with this proposal? And uh, this one, because it has uh, the most units, uh, has the greatest impact on uh, housing employees. Sorry, question on this slide? Go ahead, uh, George. Bob, go back to that slide. So uh, remind me um, why we would have the storage units uh, below the proposed new units versus vice versa. Um, well, the the uh, the road is is sort of defining uh, where the uh, pads are for oops, sorry for the new units and uh, the storage units. Those could be in a different location. There could be fewer of them. We've got some some time once we figure out where we want the homes to be to uh, dial in the storage units. But yeah, I do just, think, yeah. It, it's just hard to uh, visualize this along the road, whether you'd be looking at storage units uh, versus homes. And it seems like it'd be more cost effective to have the homes down lower by the road and the storage units above. But I, it's, hard, it's hard for me to visualize this. I think that's um, something that we could we could look at. And um, so uh, that's a comment that we should take into consideration of, you know, looking at potentially flipping. The, the road would have to shift a little bit, but could we flip the units and put the storage on the other side of the road or um, look at some other locations for the storage units so that they're not um, in sort of the front yards of those uh, relocated units. Yeah, thanks. So, um, looking at uh, just the whole concept of moving all the units further up valley and off of the hillside, that opens up a couple of possibilities. One would be the storage, some of the storage units could be put where the triplex units were going to be a little bit further up on the down valley end. Um, also, it leaves open the possibility of sometime far in the future, you could actually build more units down there on a steeper hillside with a bigger construction cost. And that could, I mean, that I would see decades away if if ever happening, but the land would be there, uh, would be possible to do more construction some point in the future. So uh, moving the, I mean, I kind of like the idea of moving the construction up valley where it's a little bit easier, a little bit sunnier, that leaves future options open. Um, uh, so I see Kelly's hand up. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, I'm wondering, um, is there an opportunity to do a mix of triplex or quadplex? Or, you know, could the, like just looking at the locations of where the quadplex plan is versus the triplex plan, could you run the quadplex road you know, longer and put more units behind where the current units are to sort of match what the triplex plan <laughs> presents? Tongue twister. <laughs> triplex. Yes, I think there's there's an opportunity to, to mix and match. Um, uh, and, um, and some of that may be, um, uh, you know, the, the county needs to decide what mix is the best for it. The quadplex plan that, um, it is a bit of a tongue twister. Um, <laughs> that uh, floor plan is um, a floor plan that um, Habitat for Humanity um, likes. And so if they end up being a development uh, partner, um, that was something that they suggested that we looked at. But I don't think it precludes kind of a mix or a match of uh, triplexes and quadruplexes. And um, 
I think uh, one of the things, um, again, Jay has run this preliminarily by the fire department. Um, we, as we extend that road, we can't create a looped road here. And um, I don't know if there's some point at which the, the road, the dead end road uh, becomes um, more, more challenging. So at least at, at this sort of conceptual level, um, we've gotten, you know, not a red flag, stop what you're doing from the fire department. Um, whether we could do what Steve was suggesting, which is combine this with the um, approved plan and continue triplexes all the way up um, is something that we would want to get their feedback on. Steve, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Patty, and then Kelly. Oh, were you done? Um, I'll let Kelly finish. No, it's okay. I think Laura just answered my question. I was suggesting that the the road just match what the triplex plan proposes, which would allow the opportunity for more units. It's no secret I have supported more units, so that's a bit of a point for the board to discuss. Okay, my turn. Um, in the triplex and the quadplex plan, we only have nine pads for relocation. Um, is that enough? Since the the other, it says ten, but there's if you count them, there's nine. So we're missing one, I, unless I'm missing it. Um, and I, so we need to clarify that. But also George's c concerns about the storage. I would not want to relocate my house on a road that's now going to be used by everybody going to and from their storage units, which are literally in my view plane and in my front yard. Um, I, I, that would not make me happy having to relocate my home there from a place that I, you know, especially if I'm moving from across the river to now, you know, that, that's, 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 that's a tough one. And also on these, these the triplex and the quadplex plans, um, I still have a concern about putting them just below the debris flow basin that we'd have to do improvements there and then in the long term the homeowners the homeowners association would be responsible for maintaining that and cleaning that um, do we really need that expense um, and I appreciate this new information being shown to us I appreciate Habitat for Humanity's interest in being a partner but we don't know if that's going to come to fruition or not so it's hard for me to base my decision on a plan that Habitat supports um, we approved a plan last time we talked, and I'm kind of sticking with what we approved. I think that was a better, a better option for us, especially with, um, you know, encroaching more into the pasture, which I think is important for us to maintain. So um, I'm not quite sure I'm sold on either one of the new plans. Um, as far as the number of units, I, I recognize and appreciate Kelly's, you know, wanting to, to put a few more units in there, but, you know, um, we have to remember that we're dealing with the Woody Creek Caucus, so we have to be careful um, with that. And I think, um, I think there's future possibilities for us to do somewhere down the road when there's more funding um, to put in some more units. Because it's, I, you know, I think we need to approach it carefully, but I'm really concerned about putting units right below a debris flow area when we're asking people to move their units because they're in a debris flow area, even though it's minimal. It's not as bad as the, the, the one that um, is going to cause the road to be dead-ended. Dead ended. Um, but I, I, that's of concern to me. Great. So, Greg? Great, thank you. Yeah, if we could look at that again. Um, uh, I really appreciate what Patty just said, and, and, I, and everyone else as well. Um, I, I am concerned, um, just getting back to your comment on the, the debris flow, I guess that's a lesser debris flow. It looks like, is there a actual debris uh, divert wall there on that last southernmost unit of the, um, of the quadruplexes? Is that actually like a, a, a protection wall of some sort, retaining wall, or a, I'm just looking at that, that black line, yeah. you know, with the steep slope. That's only, um that's to maintain the grade so that um, is not any kind of a mud flow wall that's not a mud flow okay it doesn't no. seem like you really need one i, I no. i'm okay with that no. i am concerned about encroaching more on the meadow i think originally 
the things that concern me, the things that appeal most to me about this is that it, it keeps all the development on the east side of the road. I do really like that. Um, I prefer not to be encroaching in the meadow, and I guess I want to understand what the actual increase in cost would actually be if we stuck to the plan to keep the new development up above um, the existing units, the existing park, the way I think that was how we had it in the first iteration. Um, one, because I'm worried about sprawl. I'm worried about this thing sprawling, and I'm concerned about the visibility from the highway and the other roads. Um, I certainly would love it to be as low key as possible. Um, you know, if we're going to if we're going to develop a new area of the valley, I think it should be a, a very low profile. Personally. Um, Regarding the number of units, I'm okay with that. Of course, there's always going to be hunger for more, and maybe the money, maybe the, the you know, becomes more economical to, to add more, you know, for cost per unit. Uh, but I'm comfortable with this amount for now. Um, I'd love to see what a what would a, a, a view look like of this new area uh, from the highway and from the river road and and you know, from the neighbor's place just. So we know what we're getting into regarding creating a, a potential, uh, you know, uh, a large intrusion in people's view as you know, something that's going to shock people. Steve, let me know when you want me to move forward. Um, the one other consideration that I have. Um, if you're if we're going to be putting in storage units for the convenience of the residents of the basically four different pods of the whole park there should be storage units in each one of the four areas of the park down in the existing older part and one close to the wherever we put the 10 relocated trailers and one close to the where the quads or triplexes are and those might be able to be built into the structure of the building in that case um another thought i had is if we put the driveway where our proposed driveway is in the proposed plan then there could be um a branch of that heading up valley curving over and heading up valley above the field and we could actually Put some units above the uh, where it's kind of where the quads are showing in the quadruplex plan. The road would be different. It would be would one part would go down valley, one part would go up valley, and it wouldn't intrude so much on the quite as much on the field. I don't think. So uh, let's see, Bob. Why don't you go ahead? So part of what got us on uh, the discussion of the idea of quads was uh, some information that John Fox Rubin provided about a company that was opening a facility down in uh, Pueblo. And they started off with a shipping container uh, approach and now they've modified it um, and, and are, are doing something that uh, has some of the qualities of, uh, of a container, but it's modular construction. They, uh, their literature resonated with a lot of the things that the commissioners have talked about in the past. Uh, so that's why uh, we, we took a good hard look at this. Uh, zero energy ready, all electric units. Uh, they are uh, have really good insulation packages, uh, good indoor air quality. They're, they're checking off a lot of the boxes for, for things that um, the commission has expressed interest in. Uh, they aren't the only people who can build things like this, but uh, it seems to be it, it's something that they've organized their business around. The drawing and section uh, on the left is uh, to give you a sense of how this would work with modulars. There would be a garage that would serve as the platform on which the, the four units would, would sit and uh, some sample layouts there just to give you a sense of uh, these are these are small efficient two bedroom uh, units they can make them look a lot of different ways the picture that's provided there is one from their website and it's just to give you a sense of 
of one configuration and one of the uh, we wanted to point out one of the things that is that comes with this particular approach is that the circulation the access to the units is on the outside and so there are things that come with that in terms of cold weather and and uh, working with the grade at the at the site that that we would uh, deal with once we were doing the detailed uh, site planning. So I just wanted to, you to be familiar with uh, what that product was. The company's name is Indie Dwell. And then uh, another piece of what we would need. Um, so if our goals for today are are to get you to give provide us with direction for a site plan that we can take to a pre-application conference. Uh, we would want to include uh, parcels within that. So we've proposed some parcel boundaries for your consideration. The idea behind these being that you could have uh, separate parcels that if you were partnering with open space or uh, healthy rivers or habitat or anybody that uh, there would be individual parcels that uh, would be able to be a part of that uh, whatever deal was constructed. Starting on the, by the river, there's a parcel marked one. So uh, that would be basically riparian and uh, river frontage. And there's an E on that one. That's an area that would be an easement because that's where the wastewater system would be. So if it did end up with a partner organization, we would retain an easement for that use on that location. Parcel number two is the ranch house. And so by creating a parcel and, a, and allowing a, a variety of uses on that, uh, we could let that evolve as to whether that becomes a little community center, a public uh, amenity or housing uh, that could evolve over time if we have that parcel and list those uses. And parcel number three on this one is the lower ag field and uh, parcel four is the existing hillside uh, units and parcel five would be the uh, the main ag field and the boundaries of these parcels would be based on whichever one of the site plans you tell us uh, you prefer and then uh, uh, there's another e on five and that would be the easement for the solar array so for instance if uh, Picken County Open Space and Trails were to acquire this, we would want to retain an easement for being able to do a solar array, if that made sense. And then uh, parcel six is the new development area, so that if you had to do some kind of a joint development agreement uh, with a uh, development partner, there would be a discrete parcel that could be the subject of that agreement. And over on the right side, you see the various sizes of uh, of those and those would obviously uh, the final versions of those will be dependent on the site plan that you choose but at a very gross level uh, less than 10 acres of the site is used for development and uh, somewhere around 55 56 acres depending upon the scenario is preserved for uh, open space and agriculture so that's uh, an attempt to try and give you a sense of the land use and how it might be um, subdivided. You can go first. Hello. Kelly and I are dueling George over. George might have might be having his hand up. George might want to go well, first. Steve or if I can find my cursor. George, go and then Kelly. And then me. <laughs> Thank you. And then Patty. Uh, um, Again, uh, back to uh, some of Patty's concerns earlier. I, I actually I forget forgot what we originally had approved, uh, but I thought it was uh, above parcel four, mm -hmm. and it seems like we should at least have that as an option uh, to expand parcel four to include um, residents above the current uh, trailers along that hillside, but. Why, why did we why did you move away from that Bob uh, we this same drawing could exist for that plan we just did want to show you three versions of everything and the whether that parcel six was above the hillside or down here 
uh, is we're looking for that answer for, from you. Uh, the idea behind having it be a separate parcel from the hillside is that if you do have a development partner, that there, there may be financing or other reasons why having it as a discrete parcel uh, separate from the rest of it that would make sense. So, so were you, were you're saying that parcel four could still include um, units above the existing uh, trailers there? Number, this parcel six, the orange one, uh, that'll be wherever you tell us which one of these three scenarios will define that. So if you say stick with the approved one, it just goes up above uh, parcel four. Right, okay, thanks. But I'm just curious why uh, you guys have suggested uh, the different uh, location for those new units shown in the orange. It's, there's no master plan for it. We had to pick one to show parcels on because we didn't want to do three versions uh, because of time constraints. And so we just grabbed one and Delia, the uh, graphics person, did this one, and they could have easily done the approved one or the the triplex one. It's just we said show one of them so that we can explain how the parceling would work. Yeah. All right. Thanks. So, I'm just, just I'm still confused why they wouldn't have just shown the approved one. But uh, good question, George. Okay, uh, Patty, do you want to go Actually, ahead? Actually, Kelly was next, and I'll follow <laughs> Kelly. Sorry, I'm just waiting patiently. Um, okay. So I'll just say the parceling plan totally makes sense um, because each of these portions of the entire property, we will likely want to partner with different entities. And so that just seems like a clean way to be able to do that. Um, I do have a question about where or when does the subdivision aspect of this come in with regards to the current hillside units and, you know, chopping that up into smaller um, lots for the owners to have the purchase opportunity? That's a great, uh, great point. And that's one we would be talking to community development about during a pre-app is uh, and then we would bring that back to you for uh, direction as to um, how much of this we want to bite off in the first chunk and are we are we clear that we're ready to uh, offer individual lots as opposed to you know sort of the rock approach or some other cooperative approach um, we'd like to to have the advantage of understanding what process uh, community development wants to review this under before giving you a, a proposal for that. Okay, thank you. That makes sense. Okay, my turn now, Steve. Go ahead, Patty. My, my question is much the same as George's. Um, I, it was very concerning for me to see this this legend and land use with this these new ideas and not the approved one because it's not as simple as just moving six, the, the parcel six up above parcel four, because you're still gonna have the, the lots for relocation where they are in that same vicinity, and you're gonna have lots for relocation over on parcel two. So it's, it's a little different than just sliding six above four. So it would have been great to see what parcels would have been for the plan that we already approved, I think, at our last meeting. So um, I feel like I'm, I'm kind of being directed into picking a different plan when, again, I'm really happy with the plan that we approved, and I thought that we had um, kind of all agreed on that. So I, I just, you know, not that I have a problem looking at new things, but um, I was just kind of surprised to, to by some of this information. But I think having a legend in land use showing the approved plan would have been of great value in this rather than, yeah, anyway, that, that, that's a concern to me, and I, I agree with George on that. Well, I, I apologize for that, Patty. We, uh, we like the approved plan, too. Okay. 
Okay, Kelly. Thanks. Yeah, I. Um, no, I'm glad you guys came forward with some different suggestions because you know we can finesse this to be the best project it can be. And one of the advantages I really see is um, removing so much additional roadway that we may not need to um, build or improve on. But I need to ask a question regarding that because I may be basing that on some assumption. So, um, you know, in our approved plan, we have a whole kind of end-to-end -end road um, from River Road to serve the four units that would be for relocation of mobile homes. Um, now, since this, these, these two new proposals move all of the units for relocation onto the one side of River Road, does that fully eliminate any need for road improvement over there? Um, does that, you know, is there still road improvements that would be necessary to serve the ranch house since that continues to be on the other side of the road? I think that would, um, we have not included any um, improvements on Lower River Road kind of in this. I mean, we're showing um, a new ped bridge potentially or things like that, but how um, the parcel one, two, and three might be utilized um, or if it was uh, purchased by um, Healthy Rivers and uh, Pickens County Open Space, how that would be developed um, we've we've not looked into that at all but sure. that it be um, more of a kind of an in a way an open space project at that point um, so let me rephrase so my assumption then I'm, I'm wondering where does the state where exactly does the savings of the linear road um, come from in the proposed plans as that, opposed to the approved plan um, Bob can you go to the next slide So when you look at the three plans um, next to each other, and if you look at the approved plan, we, um, we're we showing the, the kind of, um, I, I don't have a laser point, but there's uh, road improvements that need to be done there to um, access those six units six. kind of next to the ranch house. Mm -hmm. Whether or not that road would still need to be improved if you develop the ranch house into a community center or um, uh, that that became some sort of a recreation center um, would be, oops, Bob, we can go back. Um, uh, I think would be to be determined, but in terms of the linear feet of road that you need for housing only, um, what you have, what happens in the triplex plan and the quad plan is the, the road and the utility runs that are required for housing only um, gets shortened. Great. I think your point yeah. is a good one, Kelly, that you could still end up with needing those road improvements um, on the, the, the lower side of Lower River Road to um, facilitate whatever kind of uh, park and open space amenities you put there. Sure. No, I appreciate would, that. I just wanted be to for check a different my use. assumption. Thank you. Yep. Yep. But Steve? Uh, let's have George first, then Patty, then Greg. Uh, on, the, on, the approval, on the approved plan, uh, we talked about having a triplex or quad, quadplex as part of those units, correct or no? Yes, and so the, the approved plan, those are triplexes. I think those are six triplexes there. Those could be a quad unit if um, that was the direction of the commissioners, or it could be a mix. All right, thanks. Okay, Steve, my turn. Um, I'm going to go back to a question that I asked last time that never got answered. Um, the triplex and quadplex plan only show nine relocation lots. The approved plan has 10. Um, so somebody's winging it out there or what? And, and I don't have a problem putting some of the relocation lots on the riverside of Lower River Road, 
um, especially for people that live on the river, uh, giving them an opportunity to not be impacted so greatly by having to relocate. Um, you know, they kind of have a their special world there, and I think we need to, you know, try and accommodate as much of that if possible. If possible, I say. Um, but I need to know: were we looking at nine lots for relocation, or ten? And um, and I. Uh, that question never kind of got answered. So if somebody could answer that for me, that would be terrific. I think that we're looking at 10 in all three plans. And I apologize that um, somehow the 10th lot dropped off of the triplex okay. and the quadplex plan. I just want to make sure we keep 10 if we're saying 10. So yep. we need to be sure yep. of that. And I appreciate George's question about, I think maybe looking at a mix in our approved plan of tries and quads. Um, might be something that works out, gives us a little more opportunity for uh, some more bedrooms, and um, maybe that Kelly can think, you know, take a little pride in getting a couple more units in there. If we do a mix, I don't have a problem looking at that. Thank you. Phyllis, you, Phyllis, you had your hand up. Do you want to enlighten us a little bit? Well, I'll try. Um, one on the on the visual plane. Um, the, the replacement uh, places that we have that are uh, on the river side of Lower River Road will be more visible from both the highway and from Lower River Road versus the, on the uphill side. So that's just, just what we've been looking at. The other one is we have an August um, meeting scheduled as a follow-up to kind of uh, hone in on some of the things that you're, you're bringing to us here. Um, so maybe we can get some photos and give you a better idea of what you're looking at. I know, Greg, you're talking about what does it look like from the highway. That lower field where we have those two units are really visible from the highway, as well as the um, east side of the upper field, which we're not planning on putting anything in. So I think some of those photos that we have might be helpful to you um, that we could bring back. Um, but we're the if the parcel and whether the parcel like you can see on the approved one goes behind so maybe we design the parcel uh, Laura and Bob to include the opportunity to go up behind there so that orange area would include be, be much bigger because it would go all the way include all those options um, and then if we can begin to identify that yes those are the parcels that we want to work on designing um, the river view side, um, we still need to identify um, the state land board and what options we have about egressing out of where you can see the road is that's not on our property. So in the next month, if we come back to you with a, a little more, um, I'm just throwing that out as, as, as you're giving us ideas so we have a better idea what to come back and maybe we can get this done by the end of August and head into pre-application. Bob and Laura, am I close? <laughs> okay, Greg, and then Kelly. Great, Phyllis, thanks for that clarification. I, I appreciate seeing these three plans here, and I do really like that. The legend it, it was very good at communicating, yeah, so. I think it threw us off just with the content, but I like the way you're presenting all this, and thank you. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to revisit a, 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 a nagging thought I've had. Um, I'm looking at all the relocation units all moved over to the, uh, the east side of the road. And I'm, I'm just wondering, um, you know, that's nine units takes up a lot of ground. Should we consider eliminating those relocation units and building nine more in the quad and triplex area? pushing it farther to the north and extending it so there's the opportunity to add a few more as, as Kelly suggested, but reduce the overall footprint along the road. Um, I just wanted to contemplate that because what are we actually relocating? Are we relocating really expensive, nice, energy efficient units? My guess is not. We're relocating people who are gonna buy new mobile homes that won't be as energy efficient as what we're able to bring in. Um, I'd love to know what the economies are regarding building quadruplexes or an extra triplex or three to accommodate those rather than making a, a trailer court bigger. Um, 
I think that there may be a way to reduce the impact, reduce the footprint, and get the number of people, uh, enough number of people in there that perhaps that would work. Um, you may have economic reasons why, or maybe you've considered this already, but I, I really would love to see the hillside above the existing area used, uh, less of the metal use if possible. And, you know, maybe we don't need to relocate mobile homes. Um, I would prefer to eliminate mobile homes, quite honestly, and replace them with higher quality housing. Greg, you have to remember that people own their homes. So if we eliminate their homes, they own their those some of those homes if they can be moved. I, I, so that, uh, yeah, that, okay, I understand yeah, that's that. a concern. So that's one of the issues. So we have to look at what's the actual value of the home and what the cost is. Um, I'd love to have an understanding of that because financially we're talking about spending an awful lot of money to redevelop an area here. Uh, and if the cost of a few mobile homes, it, uh, I can't imagine it coming anywhere close to what we're thinking about spending here. So, but I, I don't know for sure. I'd love to see a, a financial analysis of that. And I'm happy to be corrected if, if it really is uh, a huge difference. But if it's a matter of an aesthetic choice for the land, the, the residents, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but I think maybe we should, uh, you know, take charge of this and put in what we think is going to work better uh, rather than trying to accommodate uh, mobile homes. It would be nice to eliminate them if we could. <laughs> okay, Kelly? Thanks. Yeah. Um, you know, I just want to say I am I, being um, compelled to um, – like the the new proposals better simply for the consolidation of utilities and roads and i think that that is just a better efficiency for our use of limited monies um and i also think it really creates an opportunity for you know the um the parcels near between river road and the river to you know do some cool stuff in the future in partnership with open space and healthy rivers and some sort of community asset there um, that you know just gives that entire space a real opportunity for a vision um, rather than than the houses that we you know or the lots that we had looked at in the approved plan and so that's my preference for us moving forward So um, let's see, George, do you have a comment? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I probably have a, a bit of a hybrid from Kelly's. Um, I, I guess I, not. Yeah, I, I, can you hear me, no, Steve? I like, I like the concept that all the uh, units are above River Road and, and protect the, uh, the river corridor. Um, so to that end, those units that we had, had approved originally down by the uh, – uh, along the river, I, I would eliminate those and keep that uh, for open space for for who knows what uh, at least at least initially. Um, and you know, it's just because someone has had the opportunity to live on the river on the other side for many years. This is a whole new uh, this is a whole new deal. Um, so I, I, that's what I support. I, and I would uh, I still like the the original uh, approved plan and. Um, I like Greg's idea as well, uh, but I would look at a mixture of tries and, and quads to still be able to create a few extra units on that approved plan. Um, I still have a little concern on that approved plan where we have those storage units. Uh, uh, maybe there's a, another, a better place that is being shown. Uh, but those are my comments. So one thing we didn't we never all weighed in on the idea of the different parcels, six different parcels plus the two easement parcels. Um, I'm okay with that plan. Do, should, does anybody else, does anybody disagree with that and want to uh, suggest something different? Patty? Well, the parcels don't fit where we're kind of going now. So we need to see a new legend of parcels. 
because we can't just move six above the existing units because it just, it just doesn't work. We would need to see a new legend at the end of the day. I like the way the legend was presented to us. We just need to have the accurate data of what, what we're going to put where. I don't have a problem. I can accept moving the, the new relocation lots from the riverside to somewhere on the, on the hillside. Um, and I, I think we can accommodate that. I, I really have to see the scenic impact, because we're not seeing that now, of moving the development further up valley. We, we haven't seen that, Phyllis. You're absolutely right. We have not had the opportunity like we did with the approved plan. So those, those pictures would be really worth seeing um, at our meeting in, in August before we actually move forward because I need to see what the impact of moving those and I still have a problem putting people in harm's way putting them in a known debris flow area that they're going to have to mitigate and maintain which is going to add future costs to those homeowners I mean we're always telling people you can't build in a you know and now we're putting homes there so I would like to see the new development be above the existing with a mix of units um, and then figuring out how we can accommodate the relocation lots into that either parcel four or parcel six whatever you want to call it and um and then trying to figure out i mean storage places would be great because the homes are small um but you know do we need to provide how many for everyone or we need to we need to rethink that maybe um i'd rather have a better design for scenic issues and livability than um trying to shove storage spaces in some place random so um, so again I, I kind of am approving or supporting the approved plan with tweaks <laughs> a hybrid as George called it so so Patty I I agree with you on doing a hybrid uh, one part of the hybrid that I would do would be to not have any unit at all directly below the middle the middle debris flow area just in the event of a huge storm or an accident to prevent the to eliminate the need to scoop out a debris flow area like they do in the la basin <laughs> area all the time uh so i would put some units along our existing triplex the approved plan have the road double back at some point and have some units going in the direction of the solar proposed solar uh, array. Um, another question we keep talking about, we need 10 replacement units. We, I don't believe we have 10 trailers that are capable of being even moved. So how many trailers would people actually want to be moving from the existing ones that need to be moved that, that we're capable of? maybe that's the number of existing replacement units we need and it might be something less than 10 replacement units that we actually need if someone has a pre-hud trailer that's going to fall apart if you try to move it there's no point in them buying a new trailer when they could be moving into an energy efficient quad or triplex like greg suggested so I'd like a little closer analysis to we actually need 10 replacement units. I think we can probably get by with something less. Um, one other question I have has to do with the solar array. It shows it as a quarter acre. I would love to see the solar array be large enough so that it could make all the units in the mobile home park be electrified. So nobody would have to use gas, natural gas or propane or other things. Uh, the electric homes now can be, you know, the most efficient using heat pumps and uh, heat pump, hot water heaters and all sorts of new technology there is that uh, I, I think that would be a good direction to go. So I don't know whether a quarter acre is big enough. Should we look at a a larger solar array to try to help all the units make make the whole trailer park as close to net zero as we as we can in terms of producing their own own electricity uh, last thought 
for me is I, I like the thought of moving everything above Lower River Road. Um, I would like to have some community garden aspect somewhere and that field below the river road might be uh, the place for, for that or another place could be on the quadplex and triplex plan. There's actually part of the irrigated land is in the little enclosed in the little loop and maybe that could become part of community garden way down at that end of the upper field. So um, I'm, I wouldn't be prepared today to decide one, you know, one or the, the others of these. I think we need a hybrid of it and have a little more design work to come back in August for us. Kelly. Thanks, Steve. Since we have a little more time, I would like to hear a little bit from the project team. Um, regarding the middle basin i think because we've we've started to unpack some information around that and you know i guess my concern is are we are we setting ourselves up to trade off um, high construction cost to avoid the middle basin for you know moderate long-term maintenance cost um, and so I, I guess i don't really think i understand the full risk around the flow in that area. Jay, can you speak to that or is that something we need to come back to the commissioners with in August? I think Jay can. Well, <clears throat> I think, you know, my comment would be, uh, yes, there is a maintenance component to the basin we're talking about here for the middle basin. It would not be a frequent requirement. In other words, the you know the flows we're designing for are considered 100-year events, which means theoretically you shouldn't see one you know more than once every hundred years. Uh, so it's not you know it's not an annual requirement. I think you know it's something you want to inspect once a year. But in terms of needing to do anything, it should be very rare. You may have you know, a, a small flow thunderstorm event, which puts a little debris in there, but you know, a small piece of equipment would clean it out and it'd be fine. So I don't want to overemphasize the maintenance side or say that that's a significant ongoing expense. Does the hundred year event breach that area that's diagrammed that we see? It should not. What you may get, the, the intent of the basin we had shown, and I guess it does show up on these drawings as a very light, a little bit of a lighter green. The basin was intended to basically capture the larger debris of a major event. Uh, you may have uh, some water drainage that would come below that. In other words, we would have a like a standpipe in the basin and, and a water event would be routed through a relatively small channel on down toward the lower river road and the, and the river. But, uh, but as far as debris is concerned, the, the basin we're talking about should contain a larger debris event. Okay, thank you. Steve, can I add to that real quick? Um, you know, we're all familiar yeah, with we're all familiar with hundred year events and five hundred year events, and sometimes you have three hundred year events in three years in a row. Um, you know, our climate is changing. We're seeing weather changes that, you know, are creating things that we never thought we would see before, like avalanche danger that we saw a couple years ago that was beyond anything we ever expected. Um, and with wildfires, bringing that up, if we have denuding of the vegetation above that hillside, we have greater risk of mud flow. Uh, we're seeing that in basalt. So again, um, we just don't know what's going to happen in the future. And so maybe, you know, annual, you know, take a look at it, see what you need to do. But it, it could become an issue. Um, and it's just hard for me. We're moving people out of the major debris flow and we're putting a bunch of people in a minor debris flow. And it, it just doesn't seem right to me. Uh, again, for more units and cost savings, I think by putting them above the existing, reconfiguring the mix, um, I think can get us where we need to go without having to put people in, even in a minor debris flow area. Too much history, Jay, watching debris flow in this valley. OK. 
Okay, we still have about 10 more minutes. We can still have some more discussion here. Uh, George? Well, I, I, I was just going to comment that I'm glad that um, uh, Habitat for Humanity is looking at this project as a partner. So thanks, John Fox Rubin and Gail Schwartz. And I uh, hope you're able to hear all of our comments and perhaps at some point um, uh, provide us a, a little more with your intentions and um, what you like, what you, uh, perhaps what you don't like, or what you've been hearing. And John or Gail, I, I mean, I would view that as an invitation right now. If you're prepared to say, make any comments right now, now would be a good opportunity. So Steve, it's Gail. If, um, if that works for you to say something, I appreciate that. Thank you all for letting us um, actually just be in the bleachers here because it's an important project for the county. It's an, you have a really excellent team that's putting together your concepts. And I would say that we would support where I think so much there's this really terrific thinking here and uh, assessing these the debris flow threats obviously is critical and um, just really good thinking uh, I, I think that in our initial conversations really putting units on the other side of the road uh, and freeing up that corridor you, you know my role on the CWCB and committed to water issues the more we can protect our corridors, river corridors, and riparian areas, and create community access and value, it's it's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for the county. And I, that would just be a personal, personal preference. But in terms of where the units go, the cost of development, I think it's probably uh, not that uh, that different. It was actually getting those paths for the uh, relocation uh, identified that um, does does create a, a, a commitment in terms of your, your land use. So view plane, all of which is critical, uh, whether you would encourage the existing homeowners to uh, go into energy efficient uh, units, um, whatever the, the, um, the plan brings forth, we're happy to we're, we're delighted to work with you and i think we could address your needs and looking at the, the basalt vista co uh, concepts of really creating opportunities for home ownership in this valley inefficient net zero homes has been has certainly been our priority so thank you thanks scale um further Questions or comments from the commissioners or from the, you know, Bob, Laura, your whole team, any, any other thoughts or questions you need from us right now? No, I think we uh, appreciate your comments and um, I think what, um, you know, like summary of what I've heard is uh, look at removing the units um, from between the river and lower river road that that um, is is a good option and uh, creates a contiguous open space there that has value for the county um, come back to you with something uh, you know the a hybrid say of the approved plan looking at the housing there looking at um, uh, how many replacement units we need and where those might be located uh, rethinking uh, the location of the storage. Um, I think we could also come back to you with um, some additional information on the middle debris flow so that we could show, let's say there was a 500 year event where that flow pattern is to make sure that we're not putting any units within that, um, that, that flow area. Um, and um, and we need and to see the looking visual, at, um, Laura, the visual we impacts. Need, we need yep, some, we'll look at the visual yeah. impacts and then also look at a mix of uh, triplex and quad units to um, kind of up the unit and bedroom count, but uh, keeping a, um, 
you know, doing that in a, in a good, efficient manner. Okay. Greg and then Kelly. Um, thanks, Laura. That was that was good. I, I would just add, uh, when you're talking about replacement units, I do want to find out how many, if any, and then a financial analysis of, you know, what is what would it cost? What is what would it cost, and who would pay <laughs> uh, if we decide that maybe we're not going to replace units but build more energy efficient, uh, you know, modern new you know new construction homes. Uh, along along that corridor, um, uh, just I think that's an important element: the financial analysis and the possibility that the re, that the replacement or the move, removal, whatever you call it, the relocation is even necessary. Thank you. Okay, Kelly. Thank you. And then I just want to check in with um, Phyllis. You guys will come back to us, but. I'd like to just understand what the, um, as this moves through community development, um, you know, what the public input process will be as far as um, a public hearing at PNZ, you know, what that looks like just so that there is that formal opportunity for the public to um, comment on the site plan, et cetera. I'd actually turn to Bob to answer that because he knows that process even better than I do. So our, our first stop would be with the residents once we have a, uh, a site plan that the commissioners feel good about. Our next stop would be the Woody Creek Caucus. Uh, we've met with them a couple of times and we promised as soon as we had something that was uh, expressing the commissioner's direction that we would bring that back and then we would be at the PNZ, and then we would be at the Board of County Commissioners. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, I think we've come to the end of the discussion for today. Thank, thank you, Bob and Laura, for your input, and Jay, your input on the debris flow. That was, um, you know, really informational, educational for us about that thanks so, everybody thank, thank you. you very much everybody it gets All better right. every time <laughs> thank you thank you um so we are now scheduled for a 15 minute break and to go to the core strategic plan update at 245 i see that mona is on but we don't have cindy here yet so let's take our break as scheduled and then we'll Come back at 2.45. Okay, Grassroots will be back in 15. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back everyone to the Picking County Board of County Commissioners work session on Tuesday, July 28th. We're reconvening after a short break and I will turn the meeting over to our chair, Steve Child, to continue. Okay, I'd like to welcome Mona Newton and Cindy Hoopen who will be presenting our next topic, which is a core strategic plan update. And core for the uneducated is Community Office for Resource Efficiency, which is showing on the screen there. Okay, Mona, take it away. Great. Cindy, do you want to say anything before I start? Cindy muted? You're muted, Cindy. Yeah. I said, no, thank you very much. I think you, this is about core presenting to the Board of County Commissioners, and I'm here for questions if you have any. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Well, thank you all for um, allowing me to get on your, I know it's been a very full agenda today. And um, Steve, I just want to say I was so excited to hear you talk about heat pumps and energy efficient <laughs> buildings and how much more important that is to have in affordable housing. So thank you for doing that because um, as you will see, that's one of the things that one of the areas we've really been focusing our efforts. So just a little bit about CORE. Um, we have been around since uh, 1994, so now we're in our 26th year serving the Roaring Fork Valley. And this is our tagline now. We're focusing on smart energy, less carbon, and more living. And we have been providing a lot of rebates in the last 10 years. But today we're really less focused on simply providing rebates and really more focused on putting you on a path, oh, bless you, Thank you, putting you on a path toward carbon-free living. And so for those of you um, who aren't familiar with CORE, we offer a lot of different, we offer a variety of programs. Our, our core, CORE programs are commercial programs, residential programs, and we've been offering a grant program. And if 
you look at that um, slide over the grant program, you may recognize that as Basalt Vista. And Mona, I just want to, can I interrupt really quickly because your slides aren't advancing for us? Oh. Hmm. And, and, and on my screen, I'm just getting, um, Mona, Newton has, Mona Newton has started screen sharing with this mm -hmm. little thing just going in circles. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so we want to oh, see dear. all of your hard work. <laughs> yes. I, I spent quite a bit of time. So let me, I'm going to stop sharing and then I'm going to share again. Yeah. Now? That's better. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yeah, it looks okay. better yeah. here. Thank you for alerting me. Great. Thank you for alerting me. So anyway, our, our programs are commercial residential grants and then we have a very active and aggressive outreach and education branch as well. Small team, one and a half persons. So you might notice the grant photo is a basalt vista. And we've been particularly uh, proud of that. I'll tell you a little bit more about basalt vista in a second. So our strategic plan that the board adopted last year, and I think I referenced it in um, my, our request to you last fall, our strategic plan focuses on carbon reduction, project design optimization, carbon-free culture, and organizational resilience. And carbon reduction is just that. We're focused on what we can do to reduce carbon and how we can do it through the three programs that we have and then our outreach and education to the community. And um, through carbon reduction, we really focus on what we call beneficial electrification. I know some of this may be repeat, but I just want to make sure that, you know, we're all on the same page. And then, and for those of the audience who might not know, they'll know. But carbon reduction is really focusing on beneficial electrification. And I've, I've added a, a rendering of the carbon or the arts campus at Willits. And we've been working with them substantially and that's part of carbon reduction and project design optimization. What that means is that our staff sits down and meet with people, um, and not just people, but architects, individuals, homeowners, project developers who are interested in learning more about how to build a net zero building. And if you've seen some, the recent article about the arts campus at Willis, their first, what we started meeting with them over probably two years ago when they first started conceptualizing this when it looked like um, the temporary was going to shut down and they wanted to build Taka, the arts camp Willis. And you can see in this rendering that they have solar panels on the roof. And what they're focusing on is the first net zero performing arts center in Colorado. And that's really exciting. And that's the kind of work that CORE has been doing through our project design optimization. What our core board really wanted us to do was look at how we can help to get on the front end, get in on the front end when buildings, new buildings were being designed, public buildings primarily, and how we could help them to understand what they could do to incorporate new technology. And then with our grant program, how we might be able to support them. So we've been able to support this particular project as we did with Basalt Vista uh, with a, what we had uh, was a design assistance grant to help them look at the opportunities that they could take advantage of to install and to make this building that much better. And so they're going forward with that. And that's all, um, a lot of the work that they're doing right now for their fundraising effort is to tell people that they are going to build hopefully a net zero free building. And so that's part of our project design optimization. The other area that we're really focusing on is how do, how do people understand what a carbon free culture is and what does that mean? And so we really have emphasized our path to zero through our residential program this year, taking, uh, if you've been to our website, we have, we, that's where we focus our efforts. We are focusing more on beneficial electrification, renewable energy, energy efficiency, and away from natural gas 
and even to the point where we've stopped incentivizing natural gas rebates um, beginning in 2020, and we'll continue that going forward. We still work with the commercial sector on offering natural gas rebates and upgrades and consultation because we know that it's not always as simple, and it's not even simple for a homeowner, but it may not be as uh, available, the technology or um, the cash for a business, but carbon-free culture. And with all of our outreach engagement, we've really been focusing on building um, awareness about how to be carbon-free. And then the fourth component of our strategic plan is organizational resilience. And what does CORE do? How do we continue to do the work that we've been doing, which is reducing carbon in the valley with the decline of renewable energy mitigation program funds? Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more as well. So some of our highlights from 2019, just to share with you, we distributed um, over $1.3 million in grants and rebates in 2019. And we, we track everything in Salesforce. We've been tracking it for about 10 years. But in this, this particular year, these are the results that we've been able to achieve. And it's quite aggressive what, what we were able to do uh, by eliminating 6,000 metric tons of CO2 compared to our goal. And, and part of that is the grants that we awarded last year, the Randy Udall grants. One of them was to the town of Snowmass Village. We helped them replace some very old boilers, like 40-year-old boilers on Snowmelt Road. And with our um, advice and consultation and then installing those boilers, there's going to be quite a huge natural gas reduction and the town will save quite a bit of money as well and then we can look at our utility savings 880 eight, eight, 800, over eight hundred thousand dollars and steve this is for you it's not equivalent to trees planted but it's the equivalency of taking 1400 cars off the road so people get an idea of what we're able to accomplish the total project cost is 37 million that we're able to swing, if you will, towards more energy efficiency. And we track economic benefits and it's difficult, $83 million is probably overstated with our economic benefit, but it's hard for us to just say that, um, use the 2.23 multiplier for every energy, every dollar invested in energy efficiency because the projects that we're able to incentivize, like Basalt Vista or um, the, Snowmass, the town of Snowmass Village or some of the other projects, they actually spend a lot more money than what CORE has awarded in, in grants or rebates. For example, the $500,000 that we award in the Randy Udall grants, there's a much larger investment than that has been put by those who have received those grants. And then leveraging partner funds, that's about $10 million over the course of 2019. So I think we were able to really have a real flywheel effect on projects because a lot of them would not go forward. You might ask that question, would this happen anyway? Would they do this work without an incentive from CORE, a rebate, or a grant and a lot of times the answer is no because what we hear from especially nonprofits and public entities is that the core dollars really help kick start and help leverage the money that they're able to um, that they're able to garner ahead of that so our outreach and engagement program as I mentioned it's really it's an uh, it's a you are powerful campaign we also have we've also um, last year was our second year of Imagine Climate. Actually, that was our first year of Imagine Climate. And um, we're able to raise funds for this program. It's a, it's a time of the year when we step outside of our usual, um, of our You Are Powerful campaign, and we really try to bring together the information that you can through storytelling. That's how culture gets changed, that we can bring together the art and the science and the technology and reach a lot more people that um, than we normally would through our rebates, our grants, our advising. We, I've talked to so many people in the community who have said, 
oh, you guys did that billboard or you you did that art exhibit. Yes, and then we then what happens through our community engagement at those events, we're able to reach a lot more people, we're able to engage and we're and we see action for that as well, which is really that's our objective, right? It's not just to entertain people, it's to connect and tell stories and share stories and really get results in action. One of the, and we also work with the community in different ways as well. As you know, we worked with, we work to help um, bring, educate people about the solar project that hopefully is going to be built in the not too distant future in Woody Creek. Um, and we've also worked with youth quite a bit, the uh, youth environmental group that's been pretty active in the county, um, which is really great. We worked with them on the climate strike. We've worked with them on other um, topics and other activities. And then, for example, I want to share Solar Rollers. They're a local organization who actually work internationally, but they're really bringing, um, and this is more this year, but they're really bringing online because of the, the pandemic, they're really working to bring online solar education to students and what they can do. And they, they do that by teaching uh, students how to build race cars with solar. And if you haven't ever seen some of their work, I highly recommend just going on their website and checking it out. It's pretty fun and fascinating and they're able to engage students from a lot of different ages, age groups, middle school to high school primarily. and. Um, it's really um, great to see that that project has been able to continue and blossom and they work very closely with Tesla and they work with some other companies as well, but we've been able to support them to a small degree. And then we've been working with a regional climate action group. We have what we call the Upper, Upper Valley <coughs> Climate Action Coalition and we bring uh, Upper Valley folks together to talk about uh, various ways that we can support them and how they can move forward in their own climate action plans. As you know, we've uh, conducted uh, emissions inventories. We'll be redoing those this year. We're in the process of doing some energy work, energy data gathering right now, and then working together to coalesce and talk and share information about what um, the various, the Upper Valley towns and the county are doing as well. And we've been involved in the Pitkin County Energy Code that got that you all adopted on Earth Day, again, the climate action work. And then this year, last year, we were really in just really just starting to get our wheels under us with the workforce training in Spanish and English, but we suspended that because of the pandemic. And then now we've actually, our um, bilingual person that we were contracting with has moved on um, because of um, other opportunities for her. But we hope to try to continue that because we've had requests for the workforce training. We had quite a bit of success. I think if I recall correctly, we had at least 10 different uh, on-site job trainings that we held in English and in Spanish. And we got really good response from some of the larger builder, builders, excuse me, Jen Jankala was one of them, Koru is another one. And, um, and it's great because it gave us an opportunity to go out to the job site, talk to folks, give them the, I talk to them about building science principles, why they need to build um, or change some of the way they're, they're building buildings. So that gives them that understanding of what's changing in the, in the building codes as well. And we've also worked with the local communities and make to update all of the building codes. So we have, all the communities are at 2015 right now, which is great. IUCC 2015, and except for um, Plymouth Springs, they didn't adopt 2015 IUCC, just the, the major part of the building code, but we're working on that one as well. And then um, we brought, recently brought together the building code officials and met with them, and they um, suggested that CORE could actually provide some more training and asked if requested that we might be able to do that because we've been able to establish a good rapport and a good relationship with the with the building codes, which is really um, we're really pretty happy about that. And and it was great to have um, 
most of the building code officials join us in that meeting. So uh, we've been talking about how COVID and pandemic has affected um, a lot of progress in these areas. And I, I want to emphasize that while progress has been affected, it's, it's really only been slowed and that we can't forget how important climate action is. I mean, this pandemic is going to be around. It's probably going to be with us a lot longer than we want it to be. But when we were, um, we suspended our, a lot of our assessments and uh, we pivoted our outreach uh, at the very beginning when we had to, when we, you know, when everybody had to kind of halt and we were had our stay at home orders. When we were able to resume, we had a little bit of a pent up demand. We're not as, um, we don't have as high right now to be last year. I'll tell you, in 2019, it really felt like there was a really incredibly good confluence between the economy, people's interest, their getting, understanding what we're trying to do. And we just felt like, like we were on a really good roll. Um, it's not that we're we're not in there, but of course, like many things, we uh, it's been a downturn. So right now we've, we're at about 72 assessments at this point in the year. We'd probably be at 100. Um, and but our commercial assessments and our commercial rebates are actually they're about 75 percent of where they would be at this time last year, which I think is really says about a lot about what our commercial team is doing because even as I said they shut down but they continue to make calls because we felt that this was an opportune time for businesses to make changes in their in their um, buildings if they could and we worked with this the sleep program if you're not familiar with that it's the the um, energy small lodge energy efficiency program that's run in by in partnership with the city of Aspen which unfortunately they defunded in May. I didn't realize that till recently, but we've had really good response with the small lodge commercial program because since they've been shut down, they were interested in, in um, doing some additional work on their buildings. Um, but we're continuing to do that um, regardless because we have the funding to continue to do it for the remainder of the year. So anyway, but our commercial program continues. Uh, we see a lot of requests and our staff are able to do some walkthroughs following the protocols that have been set. Some places are empty when they go through, some places aren't. They'll have one or two people on site. Organizations like SCICO are still moving forward with some of the larger projects that they've been talking about. So we've got quite a bit of activity, which is really, I mean, it's heartening because a lot of times, uh, I think a lot of people felt like it would just all stop and end. So, we and our carbon free culture and our outreach campaign our team has really pivoted we had a number of in-person events that we planned and we actually still have a couple but we'll probably likely get postponed until next year just because it doesn't look like we're going to be able to open up things like we did but we have a really so we we pivoted we have these little videos we have shorter newsletters what we call as tiny stories for tiny attention spans we're getting an incredible open rate of our e-newsletter, 25%, which is higher than newsletters for other nonprofits and even for the commercial sector. And uh, we've been able to um, continue to reach out to people. And we get really positive responses from our uh, those who do read our newsletter and open it up. And then, we, as I mentioned, we started out with our Imagine Climate program this year. We had our billboard. We had four different billboards that were painted by artists in the valley and they used ink that was made from carbon that was gathered in cities like Delhi and London and other large cities where diesel is not quite as re um, regulated as it is here. And the number of partners that we had for that was over 40 and it's literally thousands of people who saw the billboards and who have commented them and as a result we got a number a lot of people who have signed up for CORE's newsletter who have signed up to um, take action and you'll see on that one slide 177 new actions people have signed up 
so we're following up with them. Um, so our team has not been uh, idle at all during this time. They've, we've been quite busy. I feel almost like COVID has slowed things down, but um, I think we're in a lot of ways, we're as busy just trying to keep climate on the forefront, on the front burner, and then also participate in larger conversations. And I'm sure that a lot of you are as well. We're looking at what's what's gonna happen next at the state. Uh, I've been in a number of conversations with some of my old colleagues from the governor's energy office and talking uh, with other colleagues from elsewhere about what does the next administration hopefully what do they roll out for climate action? And then also at the state level, what can look like? And one of the topics that keeps coming up that we're committed to is equity and how do we keep that in the forefront as well in this time? Because it's, it's quite important. And as I said, we started out, we had um, somebody working with us who was really working with us to reach out in a bilingual way, reach out to the Latino, Latinx community. And we were making some success in there. So, so we're looking at, uh, does anybody have any questions before I continue? Greg does. Great. Hi, Mona. Great to see you. Thanks for presenting nice. to us. This is all really exciting, great stuff. I'm, I'm, unfortunately, the meeting conflicted with my I think it was my board of health meeting the other day, so I couldn't I couldn't attend the core meeting. But yeah. I'm glad to see the recap here. Um, I I, uh, uh, I think that core can be so much uh, is going to become even more useful and more necessary to us moving forward when we're looking at the dilemmas that we're in regarding the pandemic and the economic fallout after, and the huge influx we're seeing of long-term renters and second homeowners coming into our community. Somebody was just saying, you know, what's more daunting than a, a, a community full of empty second homes? And, and that would probably be a community full of full second homes. And, and what we're looking at is energy impacts. Uh, one thing in, that I've been thinking a lot about has been uh, how our bus system is trying to accommodate uh, our bus service here, uh, but we can only run at one third capacity. So effectively the cost of running passengers on our buses has gone up by three times and everyone else is driving cars. So it's, it's almost like the worst of both worlds. And, and I'm beginning to think that we're going to need the brain power at core to help us understand uh, what does climate consciousness and carbon reduction mean in this pandemic, you know, COVID uh, era that we're in. I can't say post COVID because post COVID is some far sometime in the future. So I just want to say how much I appreciate what CORE is doing. And I think it's going to be essential that CORE is part of the conversation going forward as we're looking at um, this new uh, energy intensive reality that's related to um, the, the COVID crisis, quite honestly. Right. I, I think it's it's uh, it's going to be it's going to be really interesting, Greg. And um, I've been participating in Cindy's meetings at Growth Management, and I'm trying to wrap my head around what a community of 55,000 feels like, as opposed to about 18,000. And I think we're experiencing it. And I, I I keep thinking that it's probably not going to be permanent. But I I keep then I also think we have to think about what does that look what does that look and feel like a community of 55,000 when we're trying to cut carbon emissions and uh, yeah, I think we're gonna see some energy increases. Um, and we well, as, you're, as, you're, as you were saying, you're not sure if it's going to be permanent, but I, I've talked to so many people who realize they don't need to live in Manhattan or Miami or California in order to get their job done. They can work remotely now. We're all telecommuting now, which is a great bonus uh, energy wise if done properly. But you're right, 55,000, Boy, that's not a number I'm ready for. Um, so thank you for thank you for scaring me even Sorry. more. Cindy, anything? <laughs> that's something I think we've been talking about. So, so um, anyways, we've all um, been hearing about, and last year we heard about the the REM funds are declining. They're declining for I think some of the work that we're doing that we've tightened up the building codes. Solar costs have declined. Uh, more folks are more environmentally conscious. I talked to architects 
who actually don't even bring up the energy conversation with a new client. They just build it right in. And that's just an assumption that they're going to build the most energy efficient home that they can, even exceeding the code where possible, that kind of thing. Or it's going to happen in Garfield County, even though their codes aren't as stringent as they pick in counties. So we're looking at, we've had, we had a meeting with the city council in, um, earlier this summer and talked about our rent request. And you may recall last year we requested $1.3 million from the county, $1.3 from the city for a total of $2.6 million. So we're looking at a, a large, a pretty large decrease in our budget. And that doesn't necessarily mean that CORE is not committed to attaining the same level of carbon emissions reduction that we've achieved in the past but we just have to figure out new ways to do it. This year, what we um, are proposing to request is $1.6 million. $1.4 million would come from the city of Aspen and about $200,000 would come from Pitkin County. And that's based on um, the need that the county may have, feel, does have actually, to hold on to the, a large balance that that the county has in order to be able to rebate or reimburse citizens who in, don't in, end up installing a solar, not, I'm sorry, uh, ah, a um, snowmelt system, they, or they inst end up installing a system. The balance in the city of Aspen's rent fund is, is actually 4.1 million. So this is about 30% of the of their total balance. And that's what's been the core board's policy. It's not to say that we wouldn't ask for more. We might not ask for more. We also want to be uh, conservative and think that this might, you know, this situation with rent dollars, which has been the largest funding source for core, it's funded about um, 80 to 90 percent of our entire budget over the last several years. So um, since 2014, I believe, when we ran out of the um, era dollars. And so we want to be conservative because we'd like to be able to get a portion of, of the work that we do get funded through the ramp dollars, which was the original effort. Um, so that's what we are proposing to come back to you with. Um, probably in August or September. And this, these funds will be used to fund some grants, rebates. Our grants program will change. We had uh, quite a large grant program in the past, but it'll change. Uh, it'll focus more on innovation. Um, we'll still uh, offer some rebates and climate action and outreach and engagement and some of our administration. Other revenues that we hope to be able to garner for our 2021 budget will be come from community memberships. We've always gotten those. They um, may decline depending on how we, um, if we change our service territory next year or the types of services we offer. We're going to be looking more at grants and some earned income and fundraising, and I, I didn't include that, but fundraising is part of that. And so what we'll be looking at is some income diversification. And we just recently completed our um, core board retreat, as you just mentioned, Greg. And these are some of the ideas. These are the top ideas that we came up with and thinking about ways. And we're always open to other ideas as well. But we want to stay within our wheelhouse and we want to try to focus on how we might be able to create some income with the knowledge that we have. I mean, I, I can't say enough about Marty Treadway and his capability and, and his um, knowledge and his experience. I mean, he's trained as an architect. He's one of the few commercial energy managers in the area or in the state, actually. He's now a uh, HERS Raider and he's also BPI certified. And so he's our primary person who does a lot of consulting with individuals in the public sector and and he's been carrying a lot of that. Um, so we hope to parlay that into some design and consulting and fee for service 
that we can um, we can increase uh, some revenues for our organization. We're also looking at regional climate action services. What we going beyond what we currently provide to the communities like town of Snowmass Village and town of Basalt and city of Aspen and Tickington County. Um, so that might be an opportunity um, probably. And then we're looking at developing a voluntary local carbon offset program. And while that may not be a huge income generator that is within our wheelhouse, that's something that we've been looking at um, and how do we, uh, how do we create a local voluntary carbon offset program utilizing um, ag region, uh, uh, probably some open space properties, and then of course renewable energy and energy efficiency. And we've been talking to a lot of people. We've been doing a lot of research on this topic. Um, all of them will require uh, sort of a mini business plan, if you will. And um, Income diversification is not is not uh, something that I'm unfamiliar with. When I worked at the Center for Resource Conservation, it's been a while now, but we developed a, a couple of projects or programs that are still income generators for them. And one of them is a used building material salvage program that uh, became quite successful in Boulder County. So it's not. I've got a little bit of an entrepreneurial spirit in my background. Um, and then the other is, is the carbon tax. And I've heard recently that the governor is actually potentially considering something like a carbon tax. And maybe you've heard that as well. Um, I think we've got to come up with some ways, as you mentioned, Greg, some ideas. How do we, how do we get our economy moving, but get it moving in the right direction. So we're not just relying on the same old, same old of let's um, drill oil out of the ground or let's just generate more uh, revenues in certain ways. So let's, when we were, when, you know, in the last economic downturn, a lot of money that came from the federal government, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act was really very oriented towards energy efficiency and renewable energy. And Colorado got quite a bit of funding, both directly to the state and then some through competitive grants. And, and you'll probably all remember, at least um, Cindy and George will, some of you are John Peacock will, um, three counties Pitkin, Eagle, and Gunnison received, I think it was $4.1 million through a competitive grant that came to rural area. And we parlayed that into Energy Smart Colorado. Energy Smart Colorado is still around. I have a board meeting this week. And we have a seven or eight organizations that are members and they're still funded by their local governments and utilities. And they're still active providing assessments and rebates and advising and workforce training. And so we feel that we're, you know, we would be poised, Energy Smart Colorado would be poised again to take off and deliver energy efficiency services um, in the rural mountain communities as we have. And to your point, Greg, I think every rural mountain community is blessed or suffering. I can't decide what it is with all of the new found, you know, the new love that's coming in. So, um, but we need to be ready to try to reduce, continue to reduce the carbon emissions that we've had um, that are going to be generated here. And then as part of it, fund, fundraising will be interwoven with our communications team and led by the board and me as well. So we've, we've talked about that. We're not intending right now to hire a development director, go some of the traditional ways, but to explore other, you know, what, some opportunities for fundraising for CORE. So we can continue. I know that there was, there was an article a month or two ago, I think when we had the meeting with the city council and a couple of people said, you know, it's the death knell for CORE. But my mantra is as long as there's carbon in the air, CORE still has work to do, right? So um, that's kind of where we're at. So anyway, I think that's all I have for you today. I'm happy to entertain some questions or comments, feedback, ideas. Steve? Howdy. Yeah, um, I just have a process. Um, thank you, Mona. That was great. The information 
you know, hearing it all, and I'm hoping the public is tuned in because, you know, we need to get the core word out there as often and as frequent and as clear and do as many as we can whenever we can. Um, but I have a I have a procedural question about budget approval issues. Um, if we're are we being asked next month to approve the two hundred thousand dollars as part of for course budget, but how does that play into our budget process? Because I don't remember us approving anything outside of our budget process. I mean, if it you if, do, if it's okay, you, then I'm okay and, with it. And, yeah, annually we come before the county commissioners, so the process is, Patty, I can't believe you forgot this, honey. So, <laughs> um, so with uh, with the ramp request we go before the city council and the county commissioners seeking approval for a rent request and it's separate outside of your budget because the rent dollars are collected and held separately so it has been separate in the past i do think you you incorporate something in, in, uh, that request into your budget though but my request comes to you separately well, and, and it has I, been yeah and this year i think you're more timely and which for which i thank you because um, general and generally we're, we're kind of doing some grant. I mean, there's just a lot going on at budget. So um, I, I, I appreciate this. I just want to make sure that that we could move forward with this. I know the money comes out of the rent fund. It doesn't come out of our general fund or anything like that. But it's still part of our budgetary process. Um, so I don't have a problem um, supporting core in any way we can um, and finding creative ways to keep core funded in the future. I think it's going to be exciting. So thanks again, Mona. Yeah, thank you. So well, I think um, Michael Alsey was the one who always, he hated the rent thing. Uh, as some of you will recall, he was always grousing about it. But uh, we all knew that someday the amount of money coming in in the rent program was going to decrease because people would quit building projects or they were gonna build in their, their mitigation right into their project. And so we knew this day was coming when you were gonna have less money coming in and have to come up with some, some solution to bring in more money. I would, I would love to have CORE be flush with funds brought in by the various ways you have outlined. And it looks like it probably will be a combination of things to to increase the amount of money you have available. But you've been so successful at like multiplying the the carbon offset um, way more than the rent program was bringing in. So um, I hope that all these efforts that you have planned out and the core board during your retreat will come to fruition. So Kelly. Thanks. Hi, Mona. Nice to see you. Um, yeah, I hope you're having a good summer. And I guess I just wonder, do you, I have two questions. Um, I guess one, I'll ask them both and then you can answer in whatever order you prefer. But do you, how do you, how are you going to measure success on this sort of new fundraising um, effort that you guys have to undertake? And do you think CORE has to restructure its board in order to, you know, look more like a traditional nonprofit board, um, you know, moving forward or expand the membership that sits on your board? Well, I think you're, the first question is, I think we, we've always measured our success in terms of carbon, right? Mm -hmm. um, some of it we can't measure. Um, one of the one of the questions I got at the retreat was, well, how many conversations has your staff had in terms of optimization or building optimization? I didn't have the answer, but I went back and I asked Marty. And so he, he said he's had over 30 different types of conversations with individuals and building owners and developers over the course of just this year, actually, to talk to them about net zero. And, and so we measure success in actual emissions eliminated and that's how we've been able to, to do it because when we're able to offer somebody a rebate we get a lot of information from them right you get your name your address utilities utility accounts and then um and then we can estimate what you've done 
or we don't we know what you've done and then we can estimate what the savings are so it might be a little bit more difficult we'll still use our rebates we'll still use our grants and i think some of it will be looking at some of the successes i consider the taka building a success that we've been able to have um and basalt vista so we'll we'll have to look at our success in terms of some of the ways we've been able to influence the results that have happened that happened in the community we can't take credit for everything and we don't expect to be able to do that but those that we've had direct influence direct conversations with we'll take we'll take those as credit and then i think that as we're as we develop some of these newer ideas some of the um fee for service and we're able to use those funds to continue the work that we're doing or for fundraising i mean it would be great if somebody stepped up and said hey you know we see the value in what we're doing and we'll grant you a million dollars to continue the work mm -hmm. that core is doing and offer rebates and grants um we i think that's a reasonable it. request yeah <laughs> yeah I'd go for two so. million. <laughs> all right, because we could actually use it. As we all know, we have a big, we have a big lift with the amount mm -hmm. of emissions we need to eliminate in order to reach our goals. Mm -hmm. So um, even a million dollars wouldn't quite get us there, but it would certainly help. Um, so I think we'll we'll have to develop some probably some new metrics. Actually, I think if we're able to develop a carbon offset program, you know, it's going to be the amount of money we save, the amount of the, the type of project we're able to do, the emissions, there's a there's a real direct line with the carbon offset project. If we're able to do some fee for service, there's gonna be a direct line. We have a pretty good sense of how we how we would develop those metrics, I think. And we'll develop it we'll develop a better sense as we develop a a, biz, a mini business plan, I keep mm -hmm. calling it, you know, but sure. some more these are some ideas that we've just been formulating. Um, and then as to the board, um, it's it's an idea that I've I've had and floated with George, but it's something we have to do very thoughtfully because we have a we've also had a very carefully constructed board over the years, and that's what I've really loved about CORE is having that direct relationship with policymakers. We have um, who are right there, and we can have a conversation at the board meeting, and it spreads out throughout the whole valley, right? And, you have you can have Katie Schwar who is on our board as the basalt rep, and then we have George Go and Cindy, and it's, and the conversations that we can have or they have with us with me can influence what we do as well. So it's a conversation that we're I'd like to have with the board. Maybe we may want to think about do we need an advisory committee or there's some entrepreneurs who might be able to give us some ideas and suggestions. So yeah, it's, okay. it's on the. I think it's on the docket for conversation. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mona. Hey, George. So, thanks, Mona, for the great presentation. Um, what I had mentioned to Mona and to the board that this this uh, presentation today uh, to us uh, really came about from the core board's retreat and our recommendations to Mona in terms of our direction uh, for 2021 and, and next few years. And it's really a precursor for our joint meeting next Tuesday with the city of Aspen. And as you see, they are going to be a major funder. They are, they are stepping up, which I want to thank and acknowledge the city uh, for stepping up and filling uh, somewhat of the gap that we're facing uh, for the next several years with rent. So I think that's great. And so our support, um, with all the comments that that all of you have made i think will be really important for the city council to hear as well and understanding and and they do understand the importance the role that core plays uh not only in our community but throughout the entire valley in addressing our climate action plans that all the municipalities the county has uh to being able to offer grants and rebates and really um as we look at COVID and looking at ways that we're going to have to Face in terms of recovery, uh, CORE has a, a, an important role in that uh, through workforce training, uh, through providing opportunities for contractors and builders uh, and architects uh, to go out and, and do these new projects. So CORE, as I think as Greg said, uh, CORE has been and I think will continue to be the go-to organization uh, to provide that expertise and those opportunities and resources for us to uh, continue to uh, try to reduce our carbon 
footprint and try to mitigate climate change. So I think it's just important for us to remember, and I encourage uh, all of us, all of my fellow commissioners to, uh, to reinforce uh, the comments you have today uh, to city council as well. Okay, thank you, George, for those comments. And thank you, George and Cindy, for serving on the core board representing Pickens County. We've both been stalwarts on, on doing that. And thank you, Mona, for, for being here and uh, working so hard and keeping up the good work that CORE is doing. Kelly. Thanks. I just, um, you know, one additional thought, I just would like to flag that um, perhaps for future conversation, you know, I'd be really interested, Mona, in hearing about the work and research you guys have done on a carbon offset program. Um, I think it's an idea that, you know, we've just batted around lightly here. I think it's come out of our airport recommendations um, for requests for further vetting. So, you know, the, the interest is building. And, um, you know, I just want to, I want to put it out there for consideration as something that we have a collaborative conversation about. I, I'd really like to do that. We, as I said, we've been doing a lot of research. I connected with a former colleague, Susan Innes, um, who developed the Colorado Carbon Fund. So we've reached out to them and we're finding out how this can be a viable way to fund projects, whether it's agri-gen, um, improving soil um, locally. And then we've also had some conversations with um, a guy in Cindy, I think you might have heard of him, City for the City for Forest, Forest for the City, yeah. and he works on faraway forests. Um, but right now we're trying to focus on what we can do locally. And I actually just met a young lady who's working on a ranch and they're developing ways to improve the soil and change their cattle raising and their hay raising and now they're, they're they've been able to really um track the benefits and and that's how you can start monetizing what those benefits mm -hmm. are what those mm -hmm. emissions are and uh, so there's a lot of research that's doing that and because and another idea that we've had for example is um, how could we could we fund a project Aspen School District, for example, a PV project that folks might be willing to pay into, and how do you put the value, what, what's the type of value of that carbon offset, and could it have storage, and, you know, school district can't pay for that right now. They're, I mean, they're just going to be just trying to do anything, but is that a carbon offset that we could potentially create and sell as a way to kickstart this program? So we have a lot of ideas, and I would love to come back to you and share with you what we found, and how we're thinking about how it might work in the valley. So, and and I, I know that there's been a lot of uh, at the airport. There was some ideas kicked around, but now we've been sort of we've been diving a little bit deeper into it. And actually, Chris Mengus started a carbon sequestration uh, larger kind of a larger conversation. And so now we've broken up into subgroups, and I'm heading up the subgroup that's looking at carbon offsets. So we can bring everything together. Ideally. We would have a bundled product that you could purchase. Then you would say, okay, here it is. It's $3 for a ton of carbon or whatever that number is. It's probably really $40 for a ton of carbon. And then you break that down and here's where it goes to. It's going to go to towards some agri-gen, cozy points. It's going to go to help support some open space um, soil enhancements. It's going to help support a uh, uh, PV system at a school. So that's kind of my vision, but we'll see how it's going to roll out, of course. Right. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Cindy? Uh, yeah. Just to remind you guys, you have on your agenda coming up, I think August the 4th, Mona, is that correct, with the city council um, to start talking a little bit more about CORE's future and um, the look at a lot of the information that you had today um, with the city council. So I think that, I'm not sure that agenda has been set uh, specifically, but that is coming up for you in the very near future to put your heads together with the city council. Yeah, yeah, that's next week. 
yeah, yeah it's, next week. It's, it's next Tuesday, and this is a major item on the agenda. Yeah, and it's really to um, talk with the city about the rent funding and future of rent funding, and and um, yeah, kind of the, the the changes there. And, and Mona, I, I don't know if you all um, also talked about um, the issue of, of uh, geography where where the the rent dollars can be spent. Yes, we have, we have them. So we're looking at strategically, how do we continue to, um, how do we, as I mentioned early on, how do we continue to serve the region um, in this new landscape with thinking about where, um, where ramp dollars can actually be spent. And uh, because we know that we've had um, really uh, great participation in our programs throughout the valley and that's the way ramp was originally designed um and so yeah we that's a conversation i think that we um need to need to have so and we did have it at our board meeting um but we didn't delve deeply into it so we're aware of that yeah okay well, thank you so much for your presentation today, Mona. It was um, always good to hear what CORE is up to, all the good work you're doing. Um, yeah. Okay, we're going to move on. We're actually going to take a five-minute break right now at Kelly's request because there was a, something she has to do, right? <laughs> we saved five minutes so just will, for this. <laughs> thank you. Right. Thank you all. 345. Thanks, Mona. All right, grassroots, we'll be back at 345. The animal shelter has puppies.
there any way we can... I'm, I'm not there today. <laughs> okay. Can they see it? We're live, I think. Welcome back, everyone, to <laughs> Picking County Board of County Commissioners uh, work session on that Tuesday, July so 28th. Uh, we took a little bit of a break, and now that we're back to prepare for a little birthday celebration <laughs> for Patty Clapper before we go into open discussion. So if I could get the rest of the board to join me in singing happy birthday to Patty. <laughs> one, two, one, three. A two. A one. <laughs> Come on, guys. I want to hear all the boys. Happy birthday, birthday to, you. <laughs> to you. To you. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. To you. <laughs> Thank you. Are you one? Are you two? Are you three? You guys should smell this cake. It's awesome. And Kelly makes amazing cake. cake. But I'll be listening. All right. <laughs> Giving it back to the chef. That was very nice. Yes, my birthday is actually on Friday, the 31st, but this is close enough. How old are you? I'm not telling I'm old enough to have cake for my birthday. Oh, I just got happy birthdays from people that were watching. That was quick. <laughs> you mean somebody's watching? <laughs> no. I'm grabbing a piece. As long as, as, long as Patty's to eat her cake with, she is... Oh, young enough no. to eat. Guys, you are missing work. this. <laughs> I'm so sorry so, you're not here. So am I. <laughs> oh, Kelly. Mm. Are we allowed to show graphic content like this on, on local TV? It is TV? so good. <laughs> Kelly, what is this? It's so good. That reminds me, there is a couple pieces of wedding cake left over downstairs. I should have gotten one of those to just like get Greg and George's mouth water and extra <laughs> stuff. Mm. <laughs> okay, Steve. Kelly said we could go ahead and start with open discussion. Thank you. Okay, so open discussion is our next item, and we'll turn that over to John. John, what do you have today? <laughs> so uh, a few items for you today on open discussion. Um, first, uh, last week we had talked about bringing the Board of Health uh, appointment back. Um, for for the board's uh, discussion uh, and direction for appointment, and so I wanted to to put that on your radar screen and uh, um, mm. give you a little bit of time so to discuss good. that as well. Can you, uh, John? Can you uh, remind us of the uh, the applicants, their names? I, yeah. I remember that. Um, so Dr. Brad Holmes uh, from uh, ABH and uh, Dr. Giesel, um, and I am, her first name is escaping me right now. It's so embarrassing. I'm Christ sorry. Christ. Um, Steve, yeah. Christine. That's fine. I'm just, Christine. 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 Thank you. Uh, I, just want to, I just want to know who I was going to be uh, supporting. <laughs> I didn't know their names. And um, I guess I'll, I'll just start. And I, I think... Um, as Patty uh, had tried to allude to, you know, it was her way to increase our board membership, but that posted some other problems and issues because we've got two really great qualified mm -hmm. applicants, and it's it's so mm -hmm. wonderful to have um, the interest uh, and the, um, the as busy as these doctors are uh, to uh, volunteer for not only this important time through COVID, but uh, for future uh, needs for the community. Uh, but having said that, I, I, I would throw up my support uh, to Dr. Diesel. I, I think she um, 
represents a little bit broader perspective um, uh, for 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 the Board of Health going going forward in the next uh, several years. So that would be my suggestion. Although they're both uh, both would be tremendous applicants and uh, members. Greg. Um. Um, I think I'll just say that I, I agree with George. I, I think um, they would both be great. I really enjoyed speaking to both of them. Um, hopefully, we'll still have the opportunity to include them. Uh, all everyone who uh, applies going forward, you know, if they're coming with that caliber, I, I was almost going to suggest a, toy, a coin toss. <laughs> uh, that wouldn't wouldn't be nice enough. Um, but actually, Dr. Gazel, I liked what she said uh, because she does have some mental health related background. Uh, she works with veterans. She's worked with, um, with, with people in, in, uh, you know, in the, in the region and I, I, that I think, uh, will actually help her, um, you know, add some, some, uh, what, what can I say? Some, some color and some variety, uh, and breadth to the discussion. And I, and I know, uh, Brad Holmes could have as well, but I think I, I'm, I'm happy to go with George's suggestion. Kelly? Sure. Um, you know, I was leaning towards Dr. Holmes. Um, I think he, he really brings just such a diverse background in terms of the exposure of different types of public health issues and, you know, having to really confront public health as a systemic um, concern rather than, you know, focusing on disease control. Um, just based on what he's done in his background, you know, it's, I'm happy to, I'm happy to be on the losing end of either of this decision, you know, <laughs> um, and I really am grateful for both of them for applying. Patty? If I can get my mouth not full of this amazing <laughs> cake, you guys are missing it. Um, I did watch the interview last night, um, and I agree with what you guys are saying. They're both great candidates. I, too, was leaning toward Dr. Holmes um, um, because I've worked with him on other issues. So um, I'll leave it to you, Steve. To I'm, I'm happy with either one, and um, I do have a coin here, right here, Greg, if you want me to flip it, but they're both great, and um, I have a feeling we can get both of them on there at some point. Cool. I would agree if we could expand the size of the board, that would be a good solution. Um, I'm going to vote for Christine Giesel um, for a couple of reasons in addition to what have been mentioned. Number one, her husband is also a medical doctor here in Picking County. And we're kind of getting two for one because she has, you know, they talk shop at home and she <laughs> can have the benefit of talking to him about some some medical things that you know, have another viewpoint from another person that she could bring to the board. Also, we're not totally losing Brad Holmes by if we don't have him on the Board of Health because he has been very active in our our team working on the pandemic, and I believe he will continue to still be active working on, on our county's response to the pandemic. So uh, for that reason, I, I mean, I would love to have Dr. Holmes on there too, but I think we're getting the benefit of, you know, potentially three different doctors input into the, the health issues in the county by, by picking Dr. Kiesel and continuing with Brad working in the capacity that he's working right now. All right, that, uh, that gives, gives us direction and, and uh, appreciate that that's a uh, difficult but win-win uh, kind of discussion, I think, uh, or, or at least decision for you guys. Um, I wanted to see, John Ely is gonna join us. I, oh, I see him on here, okay. So uh, the, the next item, which uh, could, could also come up uh, under future agendas, but um, it, it came up last week about the uh, letter that, that the board received um, regarding an airport ballot question. I think um, 
You received another correspondence uh, today on that. And I, I know John has um, been in touch uh, with uh, at, at least one of the individuals um, who, who's been looking at that <clears throat> question and um, wanted to just spend a little bit of time talking about that and, and how to proceed because we're on tight timelines uh, for decision making. John, can I turn it over to you? Sure, but I'll bounce it to the board. Does anybody have any particular questions first? So, John, um, we haven't even talked about really about funding any improvements at the airport to date. Aside from the fact that the FAA would pay a certain percentage, CDOT Aeronautics would pay for some amount. Uh, our airport fund, enterprise fund, would pay the remainder. Uh, there was never any mention of any having to float a bond issue or anything like that for for things. We haven't discussed it, this at all at this point. Could you elaborate on? What are our funding possibilities for our care of what improvements we might or might not choose to do? Well, the funding possibilities are at this point uh, without limit, simply because the board hasn't discussed what potential direction to go in, uh, what that direction might entail as far as uh, construction. And, uh, and so there hasn't been an analysis on the expense, the degree of expense and the degree of grant funding from the FAA would dictate um, how much of the balance of the expense the county would have to generate, whether the generation of those funds would be through uh, <coughs> occurring at the airport and attributable to the airport enterprise or whether those, um, uh, uh, those uh, um, expenses would be generated through uh, uh, certificates of participation uh, based upon um, rental and use and occupancy agreements that the county has with uh, various entities at the airport um, or going to uh, the ballot and asking the voters to approve debt. Um, so really there hasn't been any discussion uh, as to how uh, or what would be funded. So right now there are no limitations on it and no um, particular necessity of choosing any one of those or other potential uh, sources of, uh, of revenue for um, funding the airport um, construction project. I don't know if that answers so, your question, Steve, but. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Kelly? Yeah, I just want to back up a little because I mm -hmm. um, haven't read any the email. Um, if it, I'm not sure if it came in the after our meeting started so is there a new context that we should be considering there's a second email that wayne sent it came in at 2 14 this afternoon so it was after the the bocc meeting began so it doesn't surprise me you haven't had a chance to see it what uh wayne etheridge is one of the proponents of the ballot question being offered to the voters through uh, the Board of County Commissioners forwarding the question or a similar question to the county clerk uh, for inclusion uh, on the ballot. The, um, the particular justifications for that are in the email. I'll let the board read uh, Wayne Etheridge's email um, for yourselves. I think it's very straightforward. Particularly what, um, what he is requesting is an ability to sit before the board with some agenda time on a work session next week. Um, the reason for that request is grounded in the fact that if the board were to decide to place a ballot question on the ballot and certify that question to the county clerk, the board would have to do so before, uh, the deadline is the very beginning of September. I think uh, it's September 4 this year, but I could be wrong on that, but it's in September. So at any rate, the board would have to adopt a resolution to forward that ballot question to the clerk and so both regular meetings in august uh, would have to have that issue on it on their agenda so uh, having a discussion um, with uh, the proponents of that ballot question on the work session preceding those regular meetings is uh, is a logical step 
So just a um, or, oh sorry. No, but, no, no, let's hurry. Okay. I just had like a procedural follow up because you know we had planned to have airport meetings in August. So is it that that would have to be debated in two regular meetings, or does it just need to have two readings? So it like we could have a special meeting, and and then is there a period of time between the two readings that has to exist? There is not a prescribed time, um, although county convention has always been on separate days. Yeah. Um, one of the readings has to be a public hearing, so there has to be a notice uh, <clears throat> for a particular meeting. They both can occur on um, irregular dates. In other words, not at regular meetings, but at special meetings, okay. uh, if the board desires to do so. Okay. Thank you. So uh, I'll just not I'll just make some comments. Um, my, my understanding from uh, Wayne's first email was his concern that um, we have not had the opportunity to gather public input uh, and, and be able to discuss the vision committee's uh, recommendations. And so, you know, to that end, um, we are going to be putting together a series of meetings that I'm sure John will be talking about shortly uh, to gather that to make the presentations uh, of the vision committee's recommendations, get public input uh, through a series of meetings, and then uh, have the BLCC take that information and, and try to make some decisions. So to have a ballot issue uh, initiative at this point is, is so premature uh, because we haven't even had that discussion in terms of what we may be doing or not. And so it makes it makes no sense to do it, frankly. And so I, I would not, not only not support uh, looking at the ballot initiative at this stage, but I don't see a need to have a, have a, um, a meeting with uh, Wayne and SOS uh, next week as well. So was... uh, Patty. Yeah, um, I, I have been thinking about this a lot. I need to see the proposed ballot question and the comparison to the one in 1995. Wasn't that year, John? And if you could get me, I want to. I want to just see. Yes, Patty. Yes, Patty. Sorry, I was muted. It was uh, 1995, right? Okay. So I'd like to see that ballot language um, as part of my deliberation on what to do, but. I'm really more interested right now in setting up the public meetings <clears throat> to review the community input for all the efforts that everybody put in to coming up with uh, middle ground proposal and ideas and thoughts. Um, uh, and I think that's important and I think that m might answer a lot of Wayne Etheridge's concerns. I mean, address them by the fact that we are working on it, but this COVID thing kind of got in our way and now the number of things has kind of gotten in our way again, but we are on that track and we are working in that direction because I think the board feels it's important to get that discussion going in a direction and, and a resolution involving what the plan might be. And I, I think we need to have the opportunity to do that. So I would agree with uh, George's assessment of it. it's way too premature I feel like the SOS effort could divert our attention from what we need to be doing, which is holding the, the public meetings on the recommendations of the uh, vision committee. Also, they're kind of, we followed their line of thinking to put a ballot question on it. That would be preempting our whole process that we've been going through and taking the decision out, out of our hands, which we haven't even had the full presentation and the public hearing and the discussion among ourselves at this point. So I would agree with George that I would vote against putting a ballot issue on for this fall. You know, maybe in a future year that would be what we would want to do, but uh, no. Um, uh, I had a com. oh, I'm sorry, Greg. You know, go ahead, John, I'd love to hear your response. I had a conversation with Wayne um, to discuss his email and the ballot language that was included there because I wasn't quite sure I understood the intent of the, of the group, of the SOS group. And I indicated to him that there was a, 
I would say, in my opinion, anyway, a strong probability that the board would think that the issue is premature. Um, you know, I think that uh, that he certainly understood my comment. There might be some utility in having a brief conversation with him and allowing those, um, you know, those members of, uh, of that group and proponents of this question um, hear from the board directly why you don't feel it's appropriate to um, put the question on the ballot this year. Just a suggestion. Uh, thanks, John. I, I appreciate that. Um, I, I would certainly advocate for hearing and having that conversation with them. Um, I don't know enough about this, having not seen their emails. Uh, I'm just wondering if we decided that it, we would contemplate having uh, the hearings necessary to, to, to talk about putting this on the ballot, can we always pull it later after we go through the other process? What I think <laughs> this process that we're talking about with our vision committee will be done, won't it? Won't it be finished by November 4th, 3rd? <laughs> uh just wondering do we want to keep our options open i i i, I think they're they're doing they're too late to the table almost but i want to make sure that they're you know if there's an opportunity to hear them out and 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 and, and we may we may like the idea of having this on the ballot after this committee conference so i'm trying to figure out how to get both the best of both worlds here uh, but I haven't, I, I don't know the content of their communication to us. So, so I'm sorry about that. I don't have that. Answer your question, Greg. Yes, the board can always decide to pull it. it, it the question would not go to the, to the voters uh, without the board's consent. So whether or not the question goes on the ballot is totally up to the DOCC. And how late could we do that? How late could we pull the plug if we decided to do that? Up until the, the, the cutoff date, which, like I said, I think it's the fourth of September, but it's the uh, it's the beginning of September, uh, regardless. Okay, Ke Kelly and then George. Sure. Um, I think that I need information regarding what a yes vote means on this and what a no vote means on this, um, in, in the context of any conversation around it. You know, I'm. Um, you know, I won't say I'm looking forward to the airport process. I mean, I'm ready to dive into the presentation and the public deliberation about it and, you know, have been thinking a lot about this. And, you know, my mind is not made up. And this process is incredibly important. And I think that there's a fairness aspect to this to be considered. Um, because, you know, this, the request for this question is directly tied to that process. And, you know, I just am thinking about, well, what does that mean for people who, you know, support the vision committee recommendations? Or what does that mean for people who support, um, you know, a runway expansion? What does that mean for people who have other issues that they care about, about bringing ballot questions to the commissioners? You know, what... I just want to be fair in how we are giving our time with regards to this specific issue. And do we give extra time to certain groups or um, points of view? Um, or do we just ask that that request be wrapped into the, the public hearings that are forthcoming, with which they will have an, a fair and equal opportunity to provide and present comment? So that's what I'm struggling with a little bit about this request. Yeah, I, uh, I was going to make similar comments to Kelly. I mean, you've got here, here you've got a, a group that has their own uh, personal agenda um, that's going to, and actually the, the bulk of the, uh, the main focal point of this ballot initiative is whether the voters would approve a bonding issue. We're no, we're even close to thinking about a bonding issue. It, it's probably years away, so it's so premature. And so then, any any group, any person can come in and say, "Well, this is this is what I would like to see." Uh, would you please put this on the ballot initiative because this is of an interest to me? And 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 this one is so premature. It it, it frankly just makes no sense at all. And. Um, it, I, I just don't see us um, 
spending the time and the energy uh, in terms of a discussion on this. And, he, and they, this group will be making public comments as well. As Kelly said, if they want to make that suggestion during public comments, they're certainly welcome to. But it could just it could just sort of free fall into another group saying, well, let's let's look at this ballot initiative or let's think about this ballot initiative. And you know how how that works in this community. And, and you're just going down a um, a rabbit hole in that. So I, I you know, uh, unless this board thinks that the timing is right uh, to have a ballot initiative, um, I think, as, as Steve said, it's it's something that uh, may be appropriate in the future once some decisions have been made, but nothing has been made at all. And certainly um, a bonding issue at this point uh, is uh, just isn't uh, practical. Kelly? Yeah, I mean, I also just, you know, would offer that um, the timing is such that should we get to through the the public process on the vision committee's recommendations and reach a stalemate, you know, there is still time at the end of August for us to refer a question if we decide we need to and our board doesn't can't make that decision. You know, so, you know, yes, it's premature. I don't know if, you know, how premature because I need to dive in. Is, is that correct that there would still be time before the 4th of August for us to put something on the ballot for 4th of September? We can, we can make that call and we don't need to have a special meeting with this group or any other group. We could have that discussion. Is that is that what I'm hearing? Or it has the ability to forward a question to the clerk for inclusion on the ballot before that cutoff, which, uh, like I said, I guess I should have double checked that. No, you're about, about right. Up. It's usually 59 or 60 days before election day. Yeah. It's, it's in that neighborhood. At any rate, so um, the board has the ability to do so with a formal resolution. To enact a formal resolution, you need to have it concluded prior to that cutoff date. And to do that, you need to have two readings on a resolution, and you need to uh, have one of those readings, a public hearing, that has been appropriately noticed pursuant to the charter. So you need some some period of time in order for the paper to get it and for it to be published and so forth. Um, anyway, um, so you can't do it like the day before, um, but you could do it with a, a series of special meetings, um, you know, up against that that publication deadline. John Peacock's praying that it helps. <laughs> He's like, oh, God, what are they going to do? Oh. <laughs> Nobody's getting any gold stars. <laughs> Please show me Greg, the light. Greg kind of implied you would want to have, go ahead and have the meeting with Wayne and his group, but that's kind of giving extra time to um, a minority group from the whole faith. ASC Vision Committee. Um, that I would appreciate be unfair that. to yeah. everybody else in the public hearing process. I think they, if they can present their case at our first public meeting, um, and if they could convince us at that time, I, I don't think they're going to convince me or George that we should put a ballot question on this fall. It, I think it's way too soon. We don't even know what we're going to do yet, so how can we do the um, I appreciate that, Steve. Yeah, I'm, I don't. Oh, sorry. I, I'm not. I'm not uh, so concerned about giving them extra time. I don't think that's my my point. My point was, if we come to the end of our process and conclude that we want to have a ballot question, maybe not related to bonding at all, but just an airport question. Do we want to reserve that option? Is that an option that this board might really like to have at the end of August? Uh, and uh, and I don't know the answer to that. No, Greg, and it, there was an email, which I did read their bonding question proposal, the exact wording of it. It is a bonding. They, you know, shall the voters of Picking County approve this bonding question for 
for you know doing whatever airport improvements i can't remember but talked about the runway or the terminal you know what combination of that but um and we might not we might decide we don't need a bonding question we might use one of the other funding mechanisms that john laid out if and when we get to that point so that's that's my thinking on it got it yeah i i wasn't even thinking about the bonding issue in, in particular i was just thinking you know what are, what do we want to have for mechanisms to keep our options open and and the, the flow of information flowing that that's really it so uh, i don't I, I i think i agree with you regarding a bonding issue perhaps it's too early uh, do we want to reserve the ability to have any other sort of ballot question and maybe it's not Maybe that's not necessary now, but I, I didn't want to end this conversation without bringing that up. George? <clears throat> well, yeah, Greg, I mean, um, to your point, the DOCC, we can always put in a, a, our own ballot initiative if, if we want to try to uh, get some feedback from the community. But, but this particular uh, question totally relates to bonding, and we're not even looking at bonding. We, I mean, I, I, I just don't get it. I'm sorry. So I think, um, I don't think we have direction to meet, meet with them next week. Um, have them bring their comments to the first, when we have our first public meeting, which I hope that's, uh, we'll discuss when those meetings are going to be here in a few minutes. Oh, this ballot question is crazy. Yeah, Steve, I, I just right. I just found the ballot question in, in the email. I just hadn't scrolled and scrolled and scrolled. Um, and I'm totally confused by what this ballot question is asking um, and where $50 million is going to come from and what's $50 million going to do out there. So, um, yeah. Uh, Again, it's very confusing and interesting, and we would need to really hone in on issues. But again, how can we ask for money from our constituents, from our taxpayers, when we don't know what we're going to do with it? Maybe by November 4th we will, or 3rd? When's the election? 3rd is it 4th? November 3rd. 3rd. Maybe by the 4th we'll know. <laughs> OK. All right. I think we've got direction on that and we're, we're going to talk in future agendas in a minute here um, uh, uh, about the timing of the meetings. Um, and I, I just want to recognize um, that this is Pat Bingham's last week uh, with Picking County uh, after 20 years. Um, if the board did not see it, Pat did write a letter. Um, it was in the Aspen Times on July 23rd, kind of mm -hmm. looking back. Uh, at her time, so you may may want to get online and and look at that. Um, we've been struggling with a uh, COVID world celebration uh, for for Pat, and uh, the the ideas that we've come up with haven't stuck. But um, I just wanted to publicly thank Pat for the fantastic work that she's done um, for the county and community uh, over her her 20 years uh with us and just uh wish her and her family the best as they take on this next chapter in their lives and uh would invite the board to to reach out to pat this week so steve can i add something to that real quick yeah patty and then george maybe uh, we all want to come yeah i i just have to say john peacock that you missed out on seeing pat bingham so when we had our holiday party at the airport terminal and we had karaoke and Pat Bingham came in a white mini skirt with white patent leather <laughs> knee high boots and sang, these boots are made for walking. And I will never forget that. She was awesome. And um, if I could find some white patent leather boots and white mini skirt, I would go sing to her for, at her party. So we need at some point to throw a Bingham party. If anything, Pat Bingham deserves a party. Yeah, I, I was just right. going to say, I was going to say, oh. uh, when, you, when you think about Bingham, <laughs> she, she was 
a one-person department. There's no other department that just has one person in it. <laughs> and the amount of work that she was able to accomplish working with all the other departments and with the community was really unbelievable, a one-person department. And, and so if nothing else, uh, Bingham just needs to be recognized for all of her hard work. And, and I know she has support staff, but the county does not have, never had any other one-person department right behind <laughs> be amazing so carry on bingham we'll mm -hmm. see you out happy trails <laughs> Drake. yeah I, I just wanted to say that i don't think it's right that that they don't have to come to us and beg to retire uh don't can't we pass an ordinance or something that, <laughs> that makes it necessary for them to, to for us to release them i'm <laughs> i'm still having trouble swallowing this it came as a surprise to me um uh, I, but I have to say, Pat seems to be having a good time already. The last photo I saw of her was on a raft wearing a Hawaiian outfit of some sort, drinking a margarita, heading downstream. And I just thought, you know, I, I can't deny her that. If, if that's how she wants to live her life now, I guess I'm ready to let her go. But, but uh, I'm, I'm still, a little, you know, still a little shaken by this whole thing. <laughs> so uh, I have... Uh, I'm maybe the only one here who had the honor of working with Craig Fitzpatrick for four, more than four years at Snowmass Village Shuttle and then working with Pat Bingham at the county for eight years. So I've gotten to really gotten to know both sides of the family. And Craig and I also ran our, well, it was my only marathon. Uh, we trained together and ran the marathon together many decades ago at this point. Anyhow, my question for you, John, is how many FTEs are we going to have to hire to replace Pat? <laughs> Pat Bingham is irreplaceable. Yeah, those are going to be uh, big shoes to fill for, for sure. And uh, yeah, we're going to miss Pat. Big white patent leather boots to fill. <laughs> That is all I have for open discussion. Steve, I have two quick things. Yeah, Patty. Yeah, um, e-bikes on the Maroon Bells. Um, there's been an issue with, um, of course, volumes of bikes going up Maroon Bells, but with young bike riders, like kids, uh, maybe 10, 11, 12-ish in that age group, on e-bikes um, at excessive speeds, and not all wearing helmets. And there was another woman on an e-bike that she had rented in town, no helmet, and she went over the bars, had a concussion, some serious other injuries, lacerations, fractures. Um, I don't know what we can do about it and how I can't imagine that these bike places don't require their people that are renting their bikes to have a helmet. Um, but maybe, uh, I'm, I'm not sure how to address it, but there are some people who are very concerned about public safety with the volume of bikes, the speed that they're going, both up and down, and the fact that they're not having, don't have proper safety gear on. Um, so that's one thing. The other issue is um, who, who can enforce masks and or um, social distancing at the Maroon Bales? It's the Forest Service but do we have any authority or, because I know the, the Forest Service workers up there have been doing their best, but there's, there, they have no backup apparently. That there's nobody that you know, is helping them out as far as, you know, it's getting jam packed up there. Even though people have to have reservations on the bus, they don't have a reservation for a spot at the Bells and they're hiking in there. Um, and there's just a lot of concern about uh, health aspects and just the just the enjoyment um, of people being too close, too packed in, and not really being respectful to others' space. So I don't know. That's maybe a legal question as to who has authority on Forest Service. Any yeah, an officer can enforce the public health order. So our and sheriffs could cruise up there and just have a presence and maybe do a little education if we can get Joey to maybe support that. No. There's no impediment to them doing so. Okay. So I'll be happy to talk to Joey about it, if it's okay with the board. Okay. Well, John, 
John Ely, can't uh, can't the Forest Service uh, do that? They can. So it seems like what we should be doing is we should be conveying this information to the Forest Service and asking for their help and support. And yeah. And I just want to note that right now, uh, not having a mask outside is not necessarily a violation of the public health order. Now that's going to be changing as we'll talk about um, in, in a couple minutes, but you know, the, the standard is that, that, that standard of, you know, if you're within six feet for 10 minutes or, or, or more, um, that you have to have a mask in an outdoor venue. So Patty, I, that, I think that's the challenge on enforcement. Now, Board of Health, uh, as you're aware, has given Karen direction to, to clarify and remove some of, right, right. of that language, which will happen this week. And as far as the forest being able to enforce, yes, they can. They're LEOs, they're law enforcement officers, but their law enforcement officers are spread out, obviously, as we know, so thin that it's really difficult for them. So. Maybe that's worth a discussion with, I don't know, Scott Fitzwilliams or, and, and or Joey. And just, you know, maybe the sheriff just make it a loop up there, you know, every now and then could also, you know, be looking at the bike issue at the same time because those bikes apparently are flying and there's a speed limit. And I think the bikes need to respect that speed limit also. And, you know, with the bus traffic up there, I'm just really concerned about somebody really getting more seriously injured than this lady did the other day. So, I don't know. Maybe it's John, you and I can talk further and see how we can approach it. I just wanted to bring it up so the board was aware. Craig? Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, thanks, Patty. I, you know, I, I, what do we have? Two law enforcement officers in the, air, in the Forest Service for the entire White River National Forest. So. We can't really expect to see them too often, but the Bells is probably the busiest site in the White River National Forest, so you'd hope we would see them there occasionally. Um, my concern is that we're constantly hearing, you know, Board of Health members and, and everyone are hearing examples, anecdotal evidence that somebody isn't following the rules. Um, and so we do have people who are super concerned and, and hypersensitive, and if they see two people without masks anywhere, it's it's suspicious. So I, I think what I'd really like to see is actual numbers and, and, and really let's study this before we decide we have a problem. Um, I, I believe you when you say, when we hear it's crowded and people are too close together and they ought to be wearing masks, if we can encourage that. But I wanna make sure that we're not overdoing it. And, um, and, and also I've gotta say the same thing for me goes for the bicycles. I ride my bike up to the bells fairly often and I've seen groups of people, but I don't see hordes of people behaving badly. I'm sure it happens. I'm sure with all the numbers of people riding up there, we're getting more accidents. That's true. Um, and so maybe maybe we need uh, more instruction on on protocols or best practices, etiquette up there. Um, but I'm I'm concerned that we don't uh, try to crack down or enforce on something that may or may not really be real or true all the time. So uh, I, I want to see the evidence before we start solving the problem. Thanks. Kelly and then George. Yeah, this just uh, this just reiterates a little bit for me what um, I think is a follow up from our conversation with the sheriff and and you know, I still think we need to have just some kind of agreed upon notion of enforcement between you know the public health department and our law enforcement agencies and other partners that may have a role which would include the forest service um you know just to be i think clear and realistic about you know what is it that we want enforced what are the high priority actions and who who is being called upon to do what and can they agree to it um, you know, and some of that was just hearing from the sheriff about enforcing quarantine and isolation orders, but still some lack of clarity around masks. And, you know, does that mean the city can help fill that or municipalities can help fill that gap, um, et cetera. So I, I, I continue to think that that's an important thing because this isn't going away. We need to envision what that looks like with winter activities as well. Um, so. I was going to bring that up in our in our COVID talk, but since we're talking about it right now, <laughs> I thought I'd mention it. Roll it in there.
Oh, I, I, actually, I was going to ask uh, on a different topic, and maybe this is coming up still for future agendas, John. Are we going to hear an update about our scheduling for our airport yeah. um, public meetings? Yes. Yeah, great. Can I do just a quick open discussion item? Um, so I want to circle around with CC4CA. Uh, we had some email traffic, and I dropped the ball a little bit, but you know we we agreed on the cc4ca policy statement um, our board does not need to ratify that based on you know our internal decision making about it but um i thought it could be you know a, a great thing to do to partner with basal and aspen who are also members of that organization to do some sort of announcement of our joint um, agreement to these principles and policy statements and what that group's goals are um, to reinforce our commitments with client climate action and so I just wanted to touch base with staff and, and the board on that I would support that maybe John Peacock can talk to the other managers and see if they can bring it before their councils though they're elected and see if we're all in agreement and then we can come up with some, some way to do that yeah and Kelly, are, are, are you thinking kind of in the form of like a joint press release or something that, that yeah. um, all the entities have, have signed off on, on mm -hmm. these policy? Yeah, and we could these, agree to some yeah. highlight. I mean, I think there's 21, you know, different policies, but we could agree to some highlights or the overarching goals to that or whatever. I think CC4C would appreciate that. Yeah. George? Yeah, one, that just reminded me, and Kelly, I don't know if CC4CA is looking at this, it's a different topic, but I forwarded everyone a, um, or I had Charlotte forward everyone a letter from a, um, an ask to sign on to a letter from um, westernleaders.org from Jessica Pace, uh, talking about a 30 by 30 uh, resolution. I don't know if anyone's had a chance to look at that or if we want to, what we want to do. I. I don't know much. I didn't really um, research what that 30 by 30 is in terms of in detail and 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 how they were going to go about it and how they were going to qualify quantify it. But mm -hmm. I, uh, anyway, I think uh, they would like to have some sort of response from us, either yes or no, or mm -hmm. instead of just ignoring them. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I can look in the, I, I can come back next week with a little more info on that, George, just as far as how does that square with our climate action plan yeah. and, you know, CC4CA yeah. and other commitments that we've already made publicly. So. Yeah, great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Also, oftentimes, the Western leaders, they typically get individual commissioners and city council people signing on as individuals is typically how they have have done things um i mean we we could potentially sign on as a board and have all our names on the letter also so we'd have two options there greg um yeah i just wanted to bring up uh, to everyone's attention there was a an article um we always sometimes we think we're in a bubble uh but the uh, jason blevins wrote in the colorado sun on the 27th yesterday uh, there's an article called uh, it's titled urban exodus Colorado resort towns are are with second home owned buyers coming in it's an article on that topic I don't have the exact title in front of me I can pull it up here um, but it, it, it basically highlights what's happening in resort towns across the country you know the, the Hamptons Jackson Hole you know they're all getting hammered with you know people fleeing the cities and and there's really no telling how long people intend to stay. I've heard people say they're never going back to New York and nor are their friends. And who knows how that'll play out. Um, but I think that this brings up uh, a lot of questions for us regarding can our infrastructure handle, you know, July 4th year round or for most of the year in terms of numbers of people. Uh, certainly we've got the problems on the highway now. It's, it's like full rush hour all the time it seems getting into Aspen um, with the reduced bus service due to the COVID uh, we've got some serious issues to confront and and um, I'll be bringing them forward and I'm sure we all will it's all pretty obvious to us but I think that uh, it, it's 
the conversation about that's going to be interesting and, and ongoing and and uh, there, there are facets to it that I don't think any of us have anticipated um, you know was it who was it the uh, the real Andrew Ernerman said you know three months ago they thought we were going into a complete recession regarding real estate and economy tourism and here we've had the opposite uh, so so I think um, we have to keep our eyes on this and 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 start talking about how we're going to respond you know we may have a, a much larger population going forward Kelly yeah this also made me think about how um, we forgot and I'm looking at Patty how do we forget <laughs> to advance our legislative ask to instate the RET <laughs> oh god I can't the, believe I forgot um, that interest in that maybe is higher this year than maybe in the past and so um, I'm happy to ask CCI if we could throw that back on the list for deliberation if they'll let a late entry um, so I just wanted to check in again with the board before I do that you can blame it on me tell them I was out of town and I came back to town and wait you forgot the red yeah I, I think that I think that people will understand that what we have is a fast changing situation with a lot of surprises and, and CCI will hopefully be nimble enough to contemplate doing that. So yeah. I, I, I would approve you doing that. And I'll help you get it okay. passed. And they've always partnered well with us in, in the past on those requests. Yeah. Okay. I definitely would put RAD, put RAD as one of our three and growing top priority mm -hmm. issues. Okay, uh, let's see. I sent an email to, to Kelly earlier. I mean, I was thinking of going in today, we would have had three commissioners in the meeting room. And I'd, we'd almost have to sit people down, but I was wondering, if, is there a way that we could have three commissioners in the meeting room, plus you, John, plus Andrew sitting there, plus a presenter? Is there room around the table for that and maintain social distancing? I don't know if we can quite manage that, but maybe there's a way we can. Yeah, Steve, I'll, I'll have to look at it closer. I think there is. I think the uh, bigger question is going to be with the um, upcoming changes with masks uh, and such that um, we will need to start wearing masks um, when we're in the meeting room uh, together throughout the, the course of the meeting. Um, and, and that's probably going to be the, the, the bigger uh, issue. I don't think we can fit more people than you just described and still keep that uh, six feet of distance. So it, it will be some time, I think, before all of us are, are back in that room. Um, gosh, our best laid plans, right? Um, who, who would have thought? Um, so yeah, yeah, I, I, I think there's probably gonna be a, a little bit of a hybrid for for some time now unless we start meeting at other facilities yeah i did see a photograph of the grand county commissioners meeting with senator bob rankin three commissioners sitting in a row at their table bob rankin sitting there about 10 feet apart none of them wearing masks very you know in a meeting last week or something so other i mean we're being extra careful here other places are not so much yeah well we we will um, encourage strict adherence to, to those rules as they come forward so let's move on to uh, future agendas which is really important today yeah so um, and I, I think rich is is still on uh, after our last meeting um, we, you know, there, there's a few moving parts here. One, um, our public health order will be changing our uh, informal or non-commercial, non-permitted uh, group size from 50 to 10. And so in order for us to have um, a, a meeting with, with up to 50, we'll either have to have a uh, special event permit or a, a commercial uh, kind of activity with an approved uh, COVID safety plan. So what we wanted to propose um, after, you know, the, those changes, we, we remain in a, in a fluid environment, 
was to have a, a kickoff meeting actually on August 6th, um, which would be uh, on Zoom. Um, we would be broadcasting that from the BOCC room because we feel like we've got the technology well dialed in there for um, these types of meetings. Um, we give the, the presentation and provide opportunity for uh, comments uh, on Zoom. Then to be followed Thursday, August 13th um, at the Door Hosier Center. And, and again, this is assuming that um, we, we can get the uh, safety plans and, and such put together um, for a maximum of a 50 person gathering. Um, that would be RSVP uh, to participate. Um, we would be filming that. Um, our suggestion is not to mix Zoom in the live meeting just because we think it's going to be difficult uh, to, to manage both the live and the Zoom, but that is a question um, that, that we have for the board. And then to conclude on Monday, August 17th, um, with another Zoom meeting, uh, again, uh, from the Board of County Commissioners uh, room. We think that that will give ample opportunity um, for um, uh, people to participate and give comments. I, I do think you probably will want to limit, um, as we, we did throughout the process, the maximum amount of time that comments can, can be given so that um, one or a, a small group doesn't necessarily um, take all the time because I, I think you're going to get a lot of comments um, from from the public and, and from people that participated. We then need to talk about whether we're setting aside time on the 17th for you to discuss the public comments and start giving direction or if you're going to want time to digest and for us to set up um, really a fourth meeting or opportunity um, for, for the board um, to, to discuss the public comment, the recommendations, and, and give direction. So I just threw out a lot at you. Um, I'd like to get comments on, on those recommendations. Okay, Patty first and then George. Yeah, I'm, I'm good with those dates. And, um, you know, I can't tell you whether or not we'd need a fourth meeting because I don't know what the third meeting is going to be like. Um, I mean, we may have some time to get started. I, I, I just don't know. I don't have a problem having a fourth meeting. Um, maybe we just need to book one just in case if we don't get things wrapped up at the end of the third meeting. Um, I, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that one, but maybe we want to reserve a spot. Yeah, so Patty, you're saying maybe reserve a spot for that fourth meeting if we don't need it, we don't need it? We can have a party, a birthday party, or an anniversary party. Okay. Yeah, I'll be late, but I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, John, do you have a, do you, tentative times for these meetings? Um, I believe yeah, um, four to seven. We, we are looking at uh, four to seven, George. And I just want to be clear on the dates because I just got a, a text. So the dates that we're looking at are August 6th, oh, August 13th, and August 17th. I think I either said 15th or I, I wasn't clear on the 17th. <coughs> yeah. I, I, I think we should definitely reserve um, a date for for the BLCC to discuss because I can't imagine after uh, listening from four to seven three hours of public comments we're going to want to start our discussion. So we should we should pick a date and I don't know if that will have to be a, a, a special meeting, John, or we're just going to use one of our uh, regular work sessions that perhaps uh, is a little more open. Let us um, I. My, my knee jerk, George, and it's probably um, from being in these meetings for, you know, 18 months is that it's a complicated and time consuming uh, issue. So my knee jerk is we should probably try and find a, a, 
a, a time to set aside a special meeting uh, for that conversation. Yeah, and, and, and the, only, the only thing I was suggesting is we've had several work sessions that we haven't started till 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So if we have another one that doesn't start to 1, we have a whole morning that we can meet with a special meeting. Sure, and we, we can look ahead at that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that works for me too. Greg, thumbs up. Kelly. Will the meetings on the 13th and the 17th also have a presentation component to them, or will the 6th be where everything gets covered? Oh. Blue has an opinion about door. that. Blue. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think, Blue? <laughs> Blue wants to play. I know. He, he's been he so good. Um, <laughs> so Kelly, I, our thinking was, and, and this will be um, challenging for you guys, but our thinking was to do the presentation um, at each meeting um, so that it, you know, folks who are participating who may be coming in fresh or are seeing the, the same information. Um, but we are we are open um, to however you guys would, would like to do it. And I'm, I'm trying to look at Rich's tile to make sure I got that right. But yeah, that was kind of the intent. We just wanted to make sure that if, if somebody did come in uh, on a certain date, couldn't make the others, if they were still getting the same information, the same presentation. And again, it's gonna be focused on the vision committee's recommendations, on, on their top recommendations, so. Don't, right. don't worry, it should only be 150 or 200 slides long. <laughs> <laughs> and so the sixth is when it would be contemplated for us to ask our questions. of the presentation yeah about the presentation yeah i mean we could we could do that we could take in your questions um and then formulate and again this is up to you guys um maybe the the 13th and 17th are are a little different because you guys have added some additional thought to them yeah. uh, that we could include in it um again it's just how you guys want to fashion those but i think our thought was that that really is the focus is on that the board's recommendation to you all you're taking public comment on those recommendations and then time would be spent in that fourth meeting or fifth or however, however many it takes to really debate that among yourselves and at that point yeah and kelly i would i would add that um i i would say it's a yes and um that you're probably going to have questions and clarifications um, at the beginning uh, when we do the first presentation and I'd imagine the same is going to be true as you hear different public comments or, or questions that there's going to be further kind of mm -hmm. questions and, and clarifications that, that may we work through in those last meetings. I just want to be realistic about if we're inviting 50 people to come and give three minutes of comment that they that we've built enough time in for them to do that, you know, or that we just acknowledge as a board that we could be there till 10 o'clock at night and so could they. Um, that's all, because if every presentation, you know, the, we could spend three, I imagine we'll spend three hours on the sixth vetting the recommendations and working through our questions, you know, then maybe an hour or more on the subsequent two days to re represent that. Um, you know, so we're really leaving opportunity for only 40 people to comment in the remaining two hours, and I think that's a very optimistic estimate. Um, you know, and some people may not say anything, or some people may have one one thing to say or not. Um, but but that but that's all. I just want to be realistic that we're we are giving a very genuine opportunity <coughs> for public comment. I, I agree with Kelly, and I think maybe limiting the public comment on the sixth to a lesser number when they, because people mm -hmm. will call it and register. Sorry, George, I just wanted to tag on. People will register to have their time, right? They'll call ahead and are we booking them in ahead of time? John, wasn't that kind of the plan? Uh, yeah, so we, that was the plan for the live meeting, not necessarily the Zoom meeting. Well, it's gonna be tough to tell people who've 
called in that we're limiting it. Okay, you're number 41. Sorry, we're done. Mm -hmm. um, I think we should have time slots and say people, we're going to take public comment from 40 people or 50 or whatever the number is and try and find out a way. I think Eagle County might have been doing something like that. I, I think that just makes because we could have 200 people at the six, and they're going to want to be heard that day. Mm -hmm. So we need to we need to have a plan. I'll come up with something tonight and call you in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll think on that. This is the challenge, yeah. um, obviously, with the COVID. Yeah. So, but what, well, I'm hearing two things. Um, um, originally, I, I thought that we were just going to have a have this presentation from the vision committee or by staff and and i don't answer this yet but my question would be you know how long is that presentation how long would that take and then we'd open up to public comments but what i'm hearing from kelly is uh, she wants to have the opportunity for us to be able to ask questions as follow-up so it's almost like um i'm envisioning is perhaps that we'll we need just to have a work session first uh, without public comment like we normally do a regular work session uh, have a presentation to the BOCC have us be able to pose some questions and concerns and then start our public comment meetings afterwards so I think we may need yet another meeting to accomplish that because I, I agree with Kelly I don't think we can have a presentation have us uh, spend time asking questions and then have public comment at the same time so I, I would revisit that and, and have our first meeting as a normal work session and then follow it up with special meetings with public comments. I remember a meeting at Redstone Inn it was about the Crystal River Trail and it was supposed to be a public hearing and the staff and the consultants took up 95% of the time Basically, they got to the end of their presentation and they, when everybody thought they were going to get their chance to speak at the public hearing, and then they just said, well, if you have any questions, talk to somebody after the meeting individually. And their level of frustration and anger in that crowd was palpable because they, that was not, they thought they were going there. That was their opportunity to, you know, speak their thoughts on the, various parts of the trail and they didn't get to do that at all and it was incredibly frustrating for them the same thing could happen on this airport thing if if we don't structure it carefully in the the first meeting where the public is able to comment we need we really need to give ample time to get in as many of them on the first time their first opportunity for public comment so i kind of like your idea george to do it that way Maybe we start, perhaps we start a meeting earlier for our benefit, and then the public comment part could start at four o'clock or something. I don't know if that would work because uh, some of the people wouldn't then see the presentation. Well, you, we, I think what I'm hearing is just making sure we have adequate time. And I, I think if the, the board is, um, willing on that first meeting to to give it, um, it it's a long day when you're in a you know one of these hearings for three or four hours but it's also something you guys do on a regular basis um, we could look at that uh, first meeting on the sixth adding an hour up front and Kelly that might give a little bit more time for um, board questions up front and time to um, start taking public comment. And John, again, I don't have a problem with that idea, but again, I think we need to have some kind of a pre-registration or pre-sign up because you, again, you might have 60 people that come and they're all expecting to speak. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to let them know we're gonna have continued meetings so everybody has a chance because we know there's gonna be a lot of public comment and we wanna be able to really hear it and, and think about it not just say oh my god we've been here for four hours listening to public comment we still have 100 people left mm -hmm. so i think we need to try and come up with some kind of a well and yeah. i'll just know just from being in the room you know it's hard to manage and track as people call in um 
you know, what order they've called in. You know, it just, it seems to like jump around a little. Um, so somebody could call in and get right in line, you know, be first in line and when really there was 20 people in front of them. Um, so it's just, that's just a technical thing to manage. I do think we should encourage written comment uh, to the board also as as a, another alternative. I, I think it should be a yes and. We'll get that too. <laughs> um, um, something Kelly said that, that that really is true, and we really need to have one person that all they do is track the phone numbers. As a new phone number appears on the list, mm -hmm. they write it on the we list. Register. We have mm -hmm. to order the phone or the Zoom people are on the Zoom call. So we can go down the list in the order that they were received because they do jump around. Uh, the person doing the talking, their number then jumps up to the top of the screen and gets very confusing very quickly and trying to remember which, which number's already called and which ones they're still on. Their number's still showing up. They already talk and just tracking that it's tricky. Greg? Just wondering if there's a way that we can get that sign up list with numbers and actually call them. So we contact them and put them in the queue and they have their window. Just a thought that might be one way and I don't even know. I'm assuming Zoom is making some huge advancements in the last few months. So maybe maybe that's the sort of thing that can be done. Um, but I, I know this is why we make the big bucks, these long meetings. As long as we get some breaks and can all go out, maybe we should have a triathlon at the same time. We can take a break and do a bike ride around the block or two or swim swim a few laps and then get back into the meeting. As long as I can get my heart pumping again, I can handle it. I think we yeah. all, we're all well, used to it. Let us take this back and, and work on the, the logistics. Uh, I, I know we have some uh scheduling options i think we may need to um reach out and and, and uh work with some folks on on uh more robust logistics is what's sounding like to me so um i think we should still try and shoot for these dates um but if the logistics uh become complicated, we may be shifting this August 6th a little bit later, because we also want to be sure we give adequate notice um, to the public uh, to participate. And John, I'm not going to be leaving town on the 20th, so I'm for the, I'm going to be here for the whole month of August. Yeah, and I, I am supposed to be going to drop the kid, kiddos off at school at some point here, so we'll figure it out. Yeah, but uh, John, I'm still a little confused why why we couldn't uh, uh, perhaps even use August 6th as just a work session for the BOCC, uh, have the presentation, it's going to be televised, uh, have us the opportunity to ask questions, just like we do with any land use issues that are large, we set aside time for us first, and then we follow up with public comment meetings with the presentation again. Yeah, no, we could probably do that, George. I just wanted to work through the, the logistics a little bit more to see if we could do a yes and just to kind of keep it moving. Okay. Yeah, yes and about six hours, but. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but it's great when I'm home. So. <laughs> I was gonna say, George, if you came in, I'd make you a cake. Oh, and you missed this cake, you guys. You, that's what you get. That might be worth it. Okay. It would be worth it. Actually, you know, that is going to be one of the uh, whenever we do meet at the door hosier, that's going to have to be in person. So we need to make arrangements there. You'll all have to show up for that one because we won't zoom in. And I'm so. not saving the cake till then. Mm -mm. Okay. All right. Be that then. was going to be my. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, that's all subject to um, things not changing with uh, coronavirus and mitigation stuff. So. I just have to throw that caveat out there. It's going to be gone by then, John. Be optimistic. I got some new masks on Daddy. order, ready to wear for those meetings. Oh, not the. Uh oh. I'm not Wait. asking. We'll have some masks available for participants. So I have one uh, agenda question. Yeah. 
Um, just one, Steve, can I ask it real quick? Uh, it's it's uh, Greg and I, Greg says we don't have a Board of Health meeting on Thursday. You know, we're kind of doing those every other, th every Thursday and John, do you know if we do? Yeah, I think we're doing, so the, the idea is just as needed. Otherwise we're trying to go every other Thursday. Okay, so and all since we haven't heard anything, community. we probably don't have one this Thursday. Correct, it's okay. the community meeting this Thursday. We? Yeah, and then I have just two quick future agenda items. Um, I think we need to leave more time for the GMQS um, discussion. Um, there's only 15 minutes on the agenda on, on the 11th, um, even though we have more time after that. So I think we should just build that in. And then can we get time on the agenda for the River District update um, with John Ely? because we've received some emails about that and they had a huge agenda for this last meeting with some questionable, some things that I have questions on. So I'd be interested in that update. Okay. Yeah, just let me just tag on to Kelly because we'd also talked about having some work time set aside for discussion regarding the River District's proposed uh, ballot initiative. We do have quite a bit of time on the fourth, <clears throat> yeah. so we could we could uh, add that in. Yeah. Okay. Any more future agendas? And if not, John, you could jump into the COVID nineteen. Let me just catch up here. Thank you all. I'm gonna. Call it an evening. Bye, Rich. Mm -hmm. Bye, Rich. Bye-bye. Okay. And so I, I, start, will, I will trying, John, I'm going to start training myself that this virus is actually the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Is the official name of it, actually? That is correct, um, which is not a uh, – it, it just hasn't – caught on with common parlance, I think, yeah. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay. I'm just going to let the dog out again. I'm sorry. The uh, joys of working at home that are our kids these days. Um, so I will, I know we are running late, so I'm going to try and go through some information. Uh, fairly quickly. I uh, want to go through a data update with you, um, talk a little bit about the public health order changes that we'll be seeing this week. Um, some other just updates and, and concerns are out there and questions as you all have them. Um, one of the, the things that's been a little bit confusing, this is one of the charts uh, from our website. Um, and you see that our cases today um, are, are showing a negative number and earlier in the week there the case numbers had gone down um, I think a dozen uh, or so and, and really what this has been is a quality assurance process that our epi team has been going through uh, in the state theater system all of this data is pulled from uh, the, the state's information system uh, for COVID and basically found that we had cases uh, assigned to us that um, were either residents of another county or, or another, another state. Um, so this data is getting uh, cleaned up now and uh, going forward, we shouldn't see uh, as, as uh, big a decrease, but um, you know we we're, we're up over 160 at, at one point. You might recall our, our current count today uh, is at 151, um, and then you can see our, our neighbors um, are still having uh, fairly uh, significant new daily uh, case count uh, averages, um, but. Uh, they are working through mitigation plans right now. I know Eagle County um, just passed theirs. 
Um, the other data that we watch pretty closely that's also on our website um, is the, uh, are, are the hospital metrics. Um, these have not changed. Basically, we're in the cautious in terms of uh, the number of people continuing to visit, um, the, particularly the, the respiratory tent uh, and the, the demand for community testing. However, our inpatient hospitalizations and essential health care workers um, with, uh, that have been diagnosed with, with COVID um, remain at comfortable levels. And we, we, again, as, as you all know, we watch this because the primary goal of, of our, our efforts, particularly with our public health orders, is to make sure we keep the rate of infection at a level that our healthcare system um, can, can absorb. We're gonna start to get into some uh, newer data um, that uh, isn't on our website at, at this point. But you can see our most recent, um, uh, mo most recent week, um, our number of infections um, has gone down to 15, which is still high uh, for that week period. Um, our um, uh, positivity rate um, has also dropped to below 7%. You might recall it was uh, in a high 9%, approaching that 10% threshold. We're now uh, just below uh, uh, 7% um, for the week between. Um, so this line, uh, this trend line has changed to show a 14 day rolling average, uh, basically, uh, for, for testing. Um, and then the, the bars represent uh, weekly results, negatives and, and positives. Um, down below, and I need to get rid of this. Hey, John, uh, just want to say, just want to make sure people realize that is, it, it says numbers represent the positive test per week, regardless of county of residence. So this is the number of positive tests the hospital is doing each week, which is an indicator of everyone who's been tested in our community, whether they, wherever they live, wherever they're from. Is that correct? Right, that is correct. And, and thank you for, for pointing that yeah. out. That's we a, get a lot of questions about that. You know, yeah, who, who isn't being counted, right? And this, this um, first chart I showed you that's pulling from uh, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment are just residential cases. So there, there's two different, we're, we're trying to show both because we get both of those questions. So thank you for pointing that out. At the bottom, uh, you'll see some data about testing and turnaround times and, and where we are right now. And you know, when, when we do have positive cases, we're, um, get, we get a sense of, or, or when people are coming in for testing, we get a sense of when their symptom onset date was so we have a good sense of when did they start experiencing symptoms versus um, when a specimen was collected. Then the turnaround time um, from when a specimen was collected to the lab result and then the, the total time at the end. And so you can see um, on average we've uh, We've had about 4.3 days from symptom onset to the time when people are, are scheduling and, and getting in to get a test. Um, that's inclusive of time that people may think, oh, I've, you know, I've got some symptoms, I'm not sure what it is, and you know, waiting to see if it goes away for a day or two, and um, you know, then, then making the appointment and going in to get tested. Right now, our collection to lab result um, average time is 2.97 days, um, but that that's inclusive of our rapid test as well as our lab test. And so we know that um, more recently, I guess there's been a high standard deviation in these numbers, and that um, you know some of the PCR tests that are going to labs are taking sometimes um, five to seven days to return versus you know, same day uh, when we're able to, to use rapid PCR. 
Uh, obviously, that's something that this board's weighed in on uh, with, with the state and ha as have our neighbors and, and many other counties. But we are tracking those turnaround times. Um, so that's our latest information on that. Um, since the one to give you a sense, um, since uh, July 9th um, in our case investigation and contact tracing, um, program. Uh, we've been, we've tracked uh, 125 contacts um, with folks who have, have tested uh, positive. We're averaging about 2.4 contacts that are at risk of infection um, per, per positive case. Um, as of yesterday, um, we had nine people uh, with isolation orders. So those are folks who have tested positive and are in isolation um, and 34 people in quarantine. And those are the folks that have had uh, an exposure, but not necessarily uh, yet a, a positive test. So our case investigation and contact tracer, uh, contact trace program uh, as of yesterday, I was working with 43 people. And of course, as uh, new positive tests come in, um, we, we add to those numbers and we have folks who roll off of these numbers as they either complete their quarantine uh, without symptoms uh, or recover from the illness. So, um, John, some wait, other... wait, wait, John, real quick. This daily COVID-19 mm -hmm. epi report is not on the website. Is That's it? correct. This okay. is an uh, internal I'm looking all over for it. You fooled me. <laughs> yeah, I'm me. sorry. Yeah, I, I, I'm trying to give you guys, I'm trying to, you know, give you a reason to listen, Patty. That, uh, well, I was, I was, all... and I'm going, where is it? He, he's, he's, <laughs> he's, he's giving me stuff I don't know. Yeah, and we are going to be trying to push some of this uh, data out in um, we're we're uh, working right now on a corona meter that was presented to the uh, Board of Health. They're just fine tuning the, the metrics on that for kind of a, a simple meter uh, where we are with metrics that, that back it up. Um, <clears throat> but you can see there's some interesting, you know, just data. And this is, unless otherwise noted, this is data since March, uh, since we got our uh, first first detected case, um, but you can see basic demographic uh, information, um, general area, and this is by zip code, um, so not necessarily by municipal boundary, but how zip code relates to Aspen, Basalt, uh, Carbondale, Snowmass Village, uh, what have you, but you can see the um, prevalence of, of positive cases uh, roughly by, by geography. And then hospitalization um, along with what were, are some uh, co-occurring uh, health issues uh, that, that folks might have. So we're um, just now really getting to a point to have uh, enough data points that this information starts to become meaningful. Our, our, and our total sample is still pretty small, but this is just getting to a point where we think this data is starting to, to become meaningful with the um, 157 um, that, that we're showing right now. Public health order uh, changes, and I believe these will be coming out on Thursday. Um, so on masks, uh, we'll be uh, of course, uh, aligning um, with, with at a minimum the, the state requirements on masks being required in uh, public spaces and buildings. Um, there are really two um, main points in, in the language, and the, the Board of Health did not fine tune the, the language uh, at, at the meeting, but one was uh, clear direction to remove the um, 10 minute requirement to wear a mask outdoors. And that requirement was being within six feet for, for 10 minutes or more. Um, and really to the greatest extent possible, clarifying and simplifying the mask requirement um, for ease of communication and if, if necessary enforcement. So um, staff is still working on that, but with the new public health order, 
um, all of the uh, the indoor spaces, public buildings, uh, the boardroom. Uh, I know uh, Kelly had asked a question about this earlier. Um, we will need to be wearing masks uh, inside, and we I can go into a little bit more detail. I've got a, a email on that. But we can take them off to speak per the governor's order. Can we take them off to speak per the Board of Health order? Run that by me again. The governor's order um, exempts you if you're, if you're giving a presentation. I don't know what the actual language is. You can take your mask off. So if I, so that people can, some people can, you know, so people can hear what you're having to say if you're speaking to an audience. Yeah, so we'll get we'll get more specific okay. uh, direction on those sorts of things, Patty. I think that was in in the instance where somebody um, may need to see your lips in order to fully understand what you're saying if they're they're hearing impaired and, and that sort of thing. Um, we can just get that clarified. That would be great. Yeah. So I know we're, we're running late. Um, we also, the, the Board of Health gave direction uh, to change the gathering size limit to 10 people for those non-commercial informal social gatherings that you know, don't otherwise have a, a COVID safety plan uh, and, and a clear point of contact uh, for, for accountability. So they're working on that language now also. Um, and then just as, as this board did in your last meeting, the, the Board of Health supported advocacy to the state for consistent rules and communications, especially uh, for visitors. Um, so that if we have tourists landing in Denver, they're not trying to, to guess what each local jurisdiction's unique rules are, are gonna be, but to have some consistency on the statewide basis. John, can I, uh, a question on the non-commercial informal social gathering size. So if it's more than 10 people, they would just need to get a special permit. I'm thinking about caucuses, my caucuses in my area that, that meet once a month. Yeah, um, or, or to have it in a, in a location where a COVID uh, business safety plan has been established. So this is this is the real challenge, George, is what we found is um, a, a, a number of our infections are traced back to informal uh, social gatherings. So we've been trying to find, um, you know, the, the, the right line with still having um, kind of organized events um, that do have COVID safety plans established to able to operate. And so, um, yeah, they would need to have a uh, caucus would probably need to have an event permit or an approved COVID safety plan. So John, okay, thanks. Let me, let me add to that question. So if I am having a non-commercial informal social gathering at my home and I'm saying having 40 people, that would actually be way too many for my house, but, but I have a planner or a caterer or somebody who has a business safety plan and I've file in addition to that a special event or an event safety plan am i still permitted to have that gathering that's that's going to turn into a, a commercial that that's not going to be an informal gathering anymore you'll have a safety plan that you need to adhere to so would you have to go and, through and, prom dev and get a special event permit or would you just have to file a safety plan so if you're if you're working with a, a commercial um, business, they will likely patty um, um, already have a plan. Yeah, I know. For example, the city doesn't issue event permits because you're in the city limits. So the city doesn't issue uh, permits for events under 50 people. So these are going to be really limited, and and that is the idea. So John, would you uh, give me some uh, ideas, direction, what I could tell, because uh, I know the frying pan caucus would be meeting uh, in a week or so. Yeah, so it'd be good for them uh, to contact community development and COVID safety plans are now part of the event uh, permitting process. All right, thanks. Yeah. 
And then, you know, there, there are other issues, you know, Greg, you, you stole my thunder on this one already. Um, you, Sorry, John. <laughs> that's okay. Um, but in, in terms of, of looking at how this is going to affect, uh, you know, our community uh, going in into the future, there's, there's a lot of different indicators uh, out there. You know, um, I, I think we're seeing our, our school districts in the Valley, uh, obviously um, really trying to track the data and get best practices um, for how schools are, are going to reopen. I know uh, Roaring Fork made their announcement. Aspen is, is still in planning and, and trying to be flexible. Um, I, I think based on, on where we're at data wise, um, you know, we, we at one point, and, and this has gone down as since this uh, story was, was run, but you know, we've, we've had uh, um, a, a high unemployment rate, especially when the um, ski areas and, and, and uh, other amenities were, were shut down in the Valley uh, in March. And then we have uh, the, this other, these other indicators, as Greg was mentioning, going on about uh, the, the great urban exodus. You know what's happening in uh, resort towns uh, right now, where uh, infrastructure like housing uh, and such that um, I, I think we're we're used to being used for a shorter period of time is seeing even potentially increased. Uh, intensity of use and schools are seeing increased enrollments um, and it's a, a, a change potentially um, uh, in our community uh, not just our population but our demands for services and our demands on infrastructure and so I think over the next um, few months we're going to be having a lot of conversation you know the, the school the school enrollments we know are, are up. I think transportation, Greg, as you pointed out, is, is going to continue to, to be an immediate challenge. Um, the, the nature of our economy is going to be interesting uh, to track, whether it's as um, seasonal or not uh, going forward for the next year or two. And um, Greg, to your point, how long does this last? You know, is this just a during COVID uh, phenomenon or is it is it something else? And so lots of uncertainties um, there with, with that. Um, I think we're also watching for the uncertainties about what happens with federal legislation around um, continued uh, support for unemployment, uh, continued support for um, folks who, who are, are struggling because they've lost, you know, um, lost employment or lost a portion of their, their income. So there's, there's still a lot for us to be paying attention to. It remains a, a fluid um, kind of an environment, but um, we, we are trying to pay attention to these different elements. And I do think it's gonna take a little bit of time uh, for us to know how this plays out. I know it's been a little unexpected. How are summers? No. Yeah, John, thank you. If I could just add a little bit on or comment on that. I think, um, you know, one of the, the comments that I love to repeat is that disruption brings opportunity as well as, you know, the chaos and the opportunity that teleconferencing has brought is, is making it possible for people to work remotely more and more. And that's affecting, it's going to affect a lot of things, uh, but that could be uh, ongoing whether or not a vaccine arrives. People may just decide to stay with social distancing living here and commuting to work um uh, so so i think that whether or not covid comes around uh we're going to see some big changes and and the other thing i wanted to bring up is just i'm, I'm concerned about food security going into the fall uh, and when budget season comes I, it's going to be interesting to see how how we prepare for potential increase in prolonged food insecurity Yeah, lots of moving parts there. So more to come, definitely more to come. Uh, just real quick, um, we are continuing with uh, regional strategies around testing. I know uh, we talked about that uh, a little bit a couple weeks ago. 
Um, CDPHE is also putting a, a meeting together with uh, Pick and Eagle and Garfield counties on are there some regional uh, mitigation strategies that, that we should be looking at. And then of course, we've um, been continuing to look at um, what are those common messages and, and communication strategies that, that we can utilize um, um, locally. Uh, CARES Act funding, a um, couple of pieces there. Um, at, at the staff level, we are talking with Snowmass Village. I think as I expressed last time, they're, they're interested in maybe using um, some or all of, of their CARES Act distribution to enhance um, our FTE counts and consumer protection, possibly the, the case investigation. Um, to, to stay consistent, provide services in, in Snowmass Village. Um, so we'll be having those discussions that may be uh, coming back, back to the board. Um, and then the, the second pot opportunity is the, uh, there's a 10% reserve held out. Um, Kelly, I think you're on that, that committee actually um, to, to make those decisions. Give My understanding um, is that communities need to obligate um, all of their first round uh, funding and then go in and um, make requests uh, against the second pot of, of CARES Act funding. So we're trying to build a strategy uh, around that to be sure that we can um, maximize the opportunities for our community to, to benefit from, from that resource. Um, and then, as I was saying, we're, we're really trying to focus and plan for um, this uncertainty around what's going to happen with unemployment benefits, increased demand on economic assistance uh, programs and human services going into the fall, uh, homelessness as evictions are, are allowed uh, again, uh, et cetera. So there will be more to come on that, and I'm sure there will be other items. Um, as we adjust to, in this really fluid environment. That's all I had for this update. So John, Sorry if can, I went through. Wait, can I ask John? John, can I ask you a really quick question? I need to submit uh, written comments to for ACRA board members. I'm going to do it tomorrow. I'm just going to, I just wanted to bring people up to speed on our airport meetings. It is, is it okay if I do that? It's kind of the sure. tentative plan because I know that's something that the ACRA board's really interested in. So I'll try and put something together either tonight or tomorrow morning early and run it by you before I send it to ACRA. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, yep. thank you. Don, I have a, I don't know if it's a hypothetical or maybe it's a, a true to life question, but if someone just came here to their second home, maybe they came from Texas their second home in Aspen they're going to be here for the rest of the summer and maybe all winter long maybe they're enrolling their kids in the school and everything so they are kind of now residents of Pitkin County but they just came from Texas and they show up with the virus or they get it shortly after arriving how do they get counted in terms of are they counted towards Pitkin County or are they counted towards somewhere in Houston where, or, you know, Texas, where they came from, just as an example. Yeah, Steve. So, that, I mean, that is a great question. And actually, we're just talking about that um, uh, amongst our um, uh, rural resort uh, managers, because we understand different things. So it is my understanding that if they are here for a period more than 30 days, they are being counted um, in, in our count. Uh, other counties have a different understanding. So we're, um, you know, that it, it is basically, they are counted to their um, address of residency, regardless um, of, of length of stay. So we are trying to get um, clarification on how CDPHE is counting that. I know we're we're looking at basically 30 days or, or over. They they probably should be ours, but um, we're we're still trying to get clarity on that. Okay, we done. All right, everybody's tired. We've covered a lot of territory today in <laughs> four and a four and a half hours. So, uh, any further questions for today from anybody? 
And if not, this work session is officially ended. And thanks everybody for your time right. and thanks, energy. Steve. And thank you all. Everyone. Take care. Thank you, grassroots. We're finished for the day. Thank you. All right. How do I take a picture? <laughs>